Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable Saul S. Sherrison, Assistant United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, to narrate tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the kidnapped paymaster. Mr. Sherrison, before you begin, I think the gangbusters audience would like to know that you brought to the studio a man who played a very important part in tonight's case. That's right, Don Gardner. He's right over there, and we'll hear from him later. Right now, I think we ought to get on with the report. All right, Mr. Sherrison. The main events in this case occurred right here in New York City. Isn't that right? In the section of New York City known as the Bronx. Almost a year ago, Don, on a Saturday afternoon, the stores in the Fordham Road District were crowded with shoppers. At one particular shoe store, a young woman customer was trying to get fitted while her companion sat next to her. The trouble clerk was on his way with still another pair of shoes to show his hard-to-please customer. Just look what he's bringing over this time. For crying out loud, Terry, you're going to buy a pair of shoes, or aren't you? If I see something that's chic, yeah. Uh, Here, madam, is a style that's very smart. (laughs) Pumps, I asked you for. Do these look like pumps? As I told you, madam, pumps have gone out. They're not wearing pumps this year. If the lady wants pumps, get her pumps. Yeah, get me pumps. (laughs) I'll take one more look. Excuse me, please. I'll be right back. How do you like the nerve of him, huh? You're not exactly the easiest one in the world to please. If I want pumps, Mac, I want pumps. That's the price you've got to pay for keeping me slaving away in that shop. Look, Terry, I don't want to hear no more about it. You stay on the job there until the time is right. And when's the time going to be right? Meanwhile, I'm breaking my back running a drill press at 40 bucks a week. Who needs it? You'll keep running that drill press until I'm set. I need another guy or two. Hmm. Who are you looking for, Dillinger? Shut up. Ain't four months long enough to find somebody? I wish you'd get your shoes and get out of here. Well, let me take my time, Mac. I'm the one that's got to wear them and I... Oh. Well, how do you like that? What? Here comes that Charlie McCarthy of yours. Bud, where? He's coming. He'd find you in Times Square on New Year's Eve. Hiya, Terry. Mac. I said you went shopping. You come to carry the bundles? What do you want, Bud? I had to see you, boss. I'm in a little jam. A cop or a dame? Lay off, will you, Terry? What kind of a jam? Where's that monkey with the pumps? I need about 300 bucks quick. 300 bucks? Well, 280 to be exact. (sighs) Must be a dame. Crying out loud, why? I owe it to a guy. Stall him. You can give him to him after we pull off the big deal. Hank, I gotta pay him off tonight. If I don't pay him, I get my head beat in. Who's got this dough coming anyway? Johnny J. Johnny J? Yeah. Don't you have no more sense than to borrow dough from a rotten loan shark? And I needed it. The horse is out at Belmont. We're hungry. So what? How much did you borrow? Two bills. What's the 80 for? That's interest. Interest? Only 5% a week. Hey, you idiot. Where do you have to meet that cigar-smoking chiseler? Oh, at some bar. Tonight. Okay, he'll be met by the two of us. Where's that guy with my pumps? You don't need any shoes. Let's get out of here. Hey, wait a minute. Come on, let's get out of this joint before I run you out in your bare feet. Okay, okay, but why get sore at me? I didn't borrow no dough from Johnny J. Let's go, I said. Let's go. I'm coming. Don't rush me. I was up at the bar. I told you this booth. Sit down. Got a match? Yeah, someplace. Yeah. Thanks. Well, give my dough, I'll buy you a drink. Look, Johnny, I haven't got it. That's what Don't I want. You want to get paid, you rotten welcher. Wait a minute, Johnny. Wait, nothing. I told you what had happened. Ever see a guy get his face burnt with a lit cigar? He'll get you dough. I bet, and tonight. There's a guy here. Has he got the dough? Yeah. He's got it. Oh, and you say so. Let's go get him. We don't have to. Here he comes. Oh, Johnny. How long's it been? That's the guy? That's him. So now, Mac. Are you come taking care of the kids' troubles, McIntyre? I look after my boys. 
Okay, bud, scram. Hey, wait a minute. If I don't get my dough, I want his hide. Get out of here, bud. Go on. Yeah, so long. I'll be safe. Hey, wait a minute. Come in. Sit still, Johnny. He only listens to me. You got a lot of nerve, Mac. One more thing, Johnny. You can stay, but that cigar's got to go. Oh, yeah? Give me a match. I said put the cigar away or I'll shove it down your throat. Well, as long as you ain't got no match. How much did the kid take from you? Comes to 280. I didn't ask what it comes to. What did he take? Took 200. But I'm entitled to my interest. Here's your 200. Hey, now, look, Mac, I'm in business. I got it. You've got to nothing. You don't want the 200? Give it back. 20, 40. It's all there, Johnny. Put it in your pocket. Yeah, I guess it is. Well, you have to drink. Nothing. I'll see you again sometime. Hey, Mac. What? Don't get the wrong idea about me. I'm still as tough as I used to be. Be as tough as you like? I'm a three-time loser, Mac. Once more, they put me away for good. I don't want that. But remember, I can only be pushed so far. Johnny, have you got any idea why I laid out two bills to get this bud out of soak? Didn't think it was out of the goodness of your heart. He's got a trick, Johnny. He can take the door lock right off a car without leaving a scratch. So, what do you want me to give him, a medal? We take it to a guy, and an hour later, we got a key that fits the ignition and the door. Sweet. Awful sweet. But it takes too many cars to build up a nice score. I want it quicker. And I'm going to get it quicker. Huh? Johnny, I got a deal in the works that I'll have to have a bushel basket to carry away the dough. Yeah, that throw the book at me this time, Mac. Told you I was a three-time loser. I'm not interested in anything. Except staying out in the street. This will be a soft as frozen custard. Worth it? Can you count up to a hundred thousand? I tried hard enough. Want to hear about it? Can't put me back in for listening. This is a big foundry over in Jersey. I planted my girl in there. The payroll runs fifty to a hundred grand every week. They pay off in cash. Payroll's got guts, Mac. They gotta add more guts to get. Look, I've had my girl in that shop for four months. I know that place inside and out. Thursday nights, the payroll lays in the safe with nobody around but an old creepy watchman. What about the safe? I don't think that'd be so creepy. That's where the gimmick comes in. The paymaster lives right here in the Bronx. We grab him at his house, take him back to Jersey. He opens up the safe. That's all there is to it. It's gonna take a lot of doing. For a lot of dough, I can stand a lot of doing. Okay, Mac, figure me in it. Didn't you uh, ask me for a match before? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Go ahead. Light up that big black cigar. I love him. Thanks. Hey, waiter. Waiter. Another round of drinks here. Make it snappy. So, Don. <clears throat> The criminal, David McIntyre, had completed his organization, which he intended to use in robbing the payroll. He had everything worked out nicely, except a few details, like a set of stolen tires and an unexpected doorbell. It was such clues as these that set the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the right trail. In the meantime, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was looking into the interstate car thefts in which McIntyre and young Bud Aldridge were previously involved. These cars were being stolen in Bronx and Westchester counties, New York, then taken to Connecticut and New Jersey, where the accessories were stripped and sold. Special agents Haynes and Martin were at the New York field office discussing the case. Well, Haynes, looks like those car thieves are going to be harder to catch than ever now. They just quit. At least while they were operating, we had a chance to get them with the goods. Uh, I don't know. I don't think they have pulled out of it permanently, Martin. Maybe they got something else to do for a few days. Maybe they took a vacation. Well, they've sure been doing well enough to take a vacation. You'd think after all this time we'd at least be able to get a line on them. We'll get our line on them. All we have to do is keep checking those junk shops and second-hand parts places. We'll find where they're selling the stuff. That's all the line we need. Well, I'd better get going. Jersey City? Yeah. I'm going to do a little hunting. Maybe I can turn up something over there. He's going to pull into that parking space down the block, Mac. Okay, double park right here. I'll keep your lights on. Yeah, Mac, sure. All set, Johnny. You kidding? Let's go. When you see this car pull out, bud, get right behind us and stay there. I know, I know. Come on. Right with you. On the sidewalk, let's go. Good 
break, good break. Nobody's out tonight. Let's do it fast and quiet. Never seen a faster guy. Here he comes on your toes, huh? Step here. Uh, pardon me, mister. Yes? Got a match? Yes, I think so. Those cigars of his keep going out. He runs himself and everybody else out of matches. Oh, some cigars are like that. Keep your hands at your sides and don't move. Hey. I'll uh, walk back to your car. Listen, here you... Walk, he said. Okay, okay, but be careful with that gun. Reach in your pocket and give me the keys to your car. All right. Well, what do you want from me? I don't carry much money. Just give me the car keys. Yeah. Here they are. Here, pal, open up. Get in, Siegel. Get... Where are you taking me? What do you think? Get in. Oh, please. Go on, get in. In back, in back. Okay, in back. Climb it back with him, pal. Right. Hey, I don't understand all this. What do you want from me? Explain it to him, pal. You're going back to your office. You're going to open that safe and you're going to hand over tomorrow's payroll. Just like that. But I don't know the combination. Now tell me what you know. But I don't, honest. Kid's right behind us, boss. Good. I told you I don't know the combination. Listen, friend. See this cigar? You know how it gets when it's lit? I don't know how many thousands of degrees hot. Please let me out. Anyway, it gets awful hot. You open that safe or you got the end of the cigar right in your eye. Let me out. I want to get out, please. Shut him up. I can't open the safe. Shut up. I can't. Okay, wise guy. <laughs> Stay shut. Don't knock him out. Not yet. I want him sitting up when we cross the bridge. Okay, okay. Uh, no sense getting those cops at the toll gate suspicious. Keep him up and keep him quiet. We'll get my treatment later if we have to. So, Don... The two criminals and their victim, Mr. Julius Siegel, drove towards the George Washington toll bridge, across the Hudson River in Siegel's car, with the third criminal, Bud Aldridge, following in their own car. Within a few minutes, they were on the approaches to the bridge and nearing the toll gate. All right, Siegel, sit up straight. I will, but don't hit me again. Now, we're going to stop at that toll gate. We're going to pay the guy, and you're going to keep your mouth shut. You got it? Don't worry, I won't say anything. You better not if you don't want the cigar. Remember. On your toes, pal, the toll gate. Here you are. Fifty cents, right? Fifty cents. Hey, the motor died. I know it. She won't kick over. I should say. I will, I will. What's the matter, Master? You got trouble? Yeah, officer. She won't kick over. Gas. No, there's plenty of gas, officer. It'll be all right. You'll have to get it out of here. Those cars want to get through. I'll give it another try. She's catching. Feed it gas. Let's go. I would have figured one like that. Well, there's a trick to starting it sometime. Oh, ask to... you. Oh. Take it easy with her. Got to open that safe. Okay, okay. I'm only playing. <laughs> Kid still behind me? Yeah, he's following us. Don't worry, go ahead. Get that a plan. I want to see what a payroll looks like. Special Agent Haynes. This is Martin. I'm glad I caught you at the office. Yes, I had to finish up something. What's up, Martin? I found a fence over here in Jersey City, Haynes. I think he's the one who's been buying the accessories of those stolen Bronx and Westchester cars. Huh? What does he have to say? Nothing. That's the point. We found two radios and three sets of tires. He says he bought them in good faith. Says he doesn't know the fellows who sold them. What's the name of this fence? Denver. Joe Denver. He's got a long record for receiving, never a conviction. All right. How about bring him into New York? I'd like to talk to him. Right. We'll be there in an hour. Oh, and say, Haynes, will you call up my wife? Tell her I won't be home tonight. But I'm telling you, I don't know the combination. Did you hear him, boss? He says he don't know the combination. I heard him. We know different. We know you open that safe every morning and close it every night. That's not true, honest. It is. Oh, it ain't true, huh? Hey, boss, give me a match. 
Why don't you carry your own matches? I'm driving. Catch. Thanks. Make it snappy. The plant's in the next block. What are you going to do? Hey, I'm going to light my cigar, that's all. Just light my cigar. <coughs> Good cigar, ain't it? I wouldn't know. <coughs> Told you how hot they get. Now you going to open that safe? Uh, uh, I... You wouldn't like it in the eye, would you? Okay. I'll open the safe. Now you're acting smart. What do you care? It's not your dough, guy. Okay. <coughs> Okay, hold on, we're turning in. There's a kid right behind us. Good. Now sit up, Siegel. Feel like we tell you, you won't get hurt. Bad. All right, I'll do anything. Come on, let's go. Okay, Siegel, move. Go on, get out. All right, I'm going. There's the kid. All right, Siegel. Walk right up to the office door, just like it worked here. Which he does, which he does. Get going. Yeah, I thought you were gone as on the bridge. Shut up and do your job. All right, I'll get excited. Here's your keys, Siegel. We'll open up the front door. But, but what? Move. John, move. You're going to open up that front door to the office and walk right to the safe, you understand? But if I open the door, the burglar alarm will ring. What's this, another store like the combination? No, I tell them the truth. The burglar alarm will ring. You're lying, Siegel. There's no alarm on that door, I know. Listen, do you think we ought to take the chance? There's no alarm on that door. He just wants to wise up the watchman. Let me tell you something, Siegel. I know this place inside and out. I know how we'll handle that watchman once we're inside. Now open up the door. But look. A cigar, a cigar. Okay. Quick now. Holy, the giant's buck. He was right. Get him in the car, fast. Come on, get to the car. Get to the car. All right, all right, I'm going. You're going to let me out here? Are you, please? Yes, yeah, Siegel, we're going to let you out. See what he's got on him. You want to get something out of this job? I'll still there, you. All right, I don't have much. It's his wallet. What's in it? Five, six, six bucks. Yeah. All this trouble for six bucks. <laughs> six bucks. Okay, he's out. Uh, take your gun and shoot him once through the head. Shoot him? I was looking for the chair. How can they tag us for it if he's dead? I'll tell you how. There's some people with big mouths, that's how. Who are you talking about? Not you. Who can tell about the kid or even the dame? Yeah, who can tell? All right, just work them over good. I want a head start in the cops. I'll work them over good. Don't worry. Ever see a guy get pistol whipped? Gun's good for more than one thing. Dirty rotten. <coughs> he won't wake up for a week. <coughs> Back <little arms. coughs> Combination. Now, I just sent Joe Denver back to the detention cell, Haynes. We'll file charges in the morning, huh? First thing... You know, Martin, I've never seen it fail. When these guys think you got something on them, they'll sing their heads off looking for a break. Uh, what a business. Well, it's not such a bad business. Joe Denver sings, we clear up a string of auto thefts. Uh, not so fast. We still got to pick up McIntyre and this young sidekick of his. Well, the information says they're probably still living at that address in the Bronx and running with this Johnny J. They oughtn't to be so hard to trace from there. Uh, we'll see about that. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Hello, Special Agent Haynes. Uh, Haynes, this Crawford over at the Richfield, New Jersey Police. Oh, yes, Crawford. How are you? We've got the victim of a robbery up here. Oh? Uh-huh. They held him up in front of his home in the Bronx and brought him over here to Jersey to open up the safe. That's kidnapping. Yeah, they carried him over the state line. That makes it your beef, doesn't it? It sure does. The Lindbergh Law. What have you got to go on, Crawford? Well, the victim, um, Siegel, got the license number of their car, but that's not going to be much help. It was stolen last week in Westchester County. Westchester, well... Tie in with anything? It could. We're working on a Westchester case right now. Stolen cars. Uh, Where is this victim? He's still here at our station. Doctor says he can go home after he rests up a bit. Well, keep him there a while. We'll be right over. Okay, I'll be looking for him. So long. Hmm. What is it, Haynes? Come on, Martin. We're going over to Jersey. I'll tell you all about it in the way. I'm ready. Oh, uh, you don't happen to have a picture of McIntyre on you, do you? Yes, I do. Good. Let's go. Six bucks. 
six lousy bucks. I spent four months slaving at that drill press for six rotten bucks. I'm sick of hearing about it, Terry. If you found out about that burglar alarm, everything would have been fine. So just shut that big yap of yours. What am I supposed to know about burglar alarms? And watch out what you're calling a big yap. Dad. Uh, oh, Bud. Oh, kid brains himself. Come on in, Bud. Pick up them cars and have a bit of moving, Mac. It's a long drive. I yeah, see the small time stuff's good enough for you now. If you ask me, it was always good enough. You're looking for a crack in the head, Terry. Yeah, from who? Let's go, bud. Sure, I'm ready an hour. If you think I'm going back to work on that drill press, you've got another thing coming. Who's asking you to go back? Do what you like. Six bucks. Six lousy bucks. Come here, Terry. Why? Come here, I said. I want to kiss you goodbye. No, stop it. <laughs> now get your dust pack and get out of here. Come on, bud. <laughs> Cheer up, will you, Mac? Ah, let me along, will you? All right, so we got a bad break. Things didn't work out right. Now we know we should stick to this hot car, Rex. Listen, bud, I'll tell you what to stick to. Just watch where you're driving. You got a red light. I see it, I see it. We got a good thing. There's a million dames like Terry. A million. For crying out of sewer. Shut up. All right, I just... Hey, look at that car. That crazy driver's gonna clip us. Oh. That driver's gonna kind of... Hey, Mac. What? Maybe it's cops. Cops, what cops? Well, let's give a piece of our mind. All right, if you say so. What's the matter? Don't you guys know how to drive? All right, get him up, you two. Huh? FBI. Not me, you know. It. You do better just keeping your hands up. What's the idea? We ain't done nothing. We've got a warrant charging you with kidnapping. Kidnapping? Yes, you should always stop to think at a state line. Come on. Your friend Johnny jay has been keeping a cell warm for you. He wants company. Okay, okay, I'm going. You don't have to push. That done was how the arrest was made. David McIntyre and Johnny Jay were sentenced to 20 years each. And Bud Aldridge was given six years. They are now serving their terms at various federal penitentiaries for abducting Mr. Julius Siegel and carrying him across a state line. Well, Mr. Siegel certainly had a rough time of it. You know, Don, that for every crime, there must be a victim as well as a criminal. And I brought Mr. Siegel to the studio tonight. Well, so I see, Mr. Sherrison. He had an experience that any one of us may be called on to face any day. Well, we're glad to have you on, gangbusters, Mr. Siegel. I'm glad to be here, Don, but I must say that in all my years of listening to gangbusters, I never dreamed that one day I'd be a part of your program. And a very important part, too. I suppose that all of us think of crimes like kidnapping in terms of someone else. It must have been some sensation when you realized that this time you were the victim. <laughs> well, Don, from the first I knew those boys meant business. But it wasn't until they were ready to leave me on, to leave me later on, that I started saying my final prayers. Well, just what happened? Well, when they got ready to go, one yelled to the other, kill him and dump him. But then he came back to me and said, we decided not to kill you, we're going to knock you out. And that's when they really gave you a going over? That's right, Don, but to tell you the truth, the beating wasn't nearly as bad as the mental torture. At first, I thought it was just another stick-up, but when my face hit the floor of the car, well, it seemed as though a million things flashed through my mind. But just what kind of things do you mean? Well, maybe this, these thugs had gotten to my wife and children. Also, even if they hadn't, I thought I'd never live to see them again. And then there was that one voice that kept yelling, if he opens his mouth, kill him. I can still hear it to this day. Well, that certainly must have been a grueling experience. Believe me, Don, it was. All I can say is, it's great to be alive. Well, thank you, Mr. Julius Siegel. And you, Mr. Saul S. Sharrison, for coming here tonight and being our guests on Gangbusters. <laughs> Leading roles were played by Ken Lynch and Joe Julian. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. Radio England, UK 2. James Stewart as the six shooter. Radio England, UK 2. The man in the saddle is angular and long legged. His skin is sun dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both. The Six Shooter. Radio England, UK 2. Paddy went on a farming holiday and the farmer gave him two golden dogs and a shotgun and said, go off and do a bit of shooting in the fields. He got back in the door and said to the farmer, have you any more dogs? <laughs> Here's the story of the 1940 cars in a nutshell. Best Bex Buick. See your nearest Buick dealer for complete details. Radio England, UK 2. Now, Auto Life.
Tonight, and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you John Lund in Lunch Kit. Suspense. Stop it. Father was getting angry. And Gus, he was so sensitive, especially at a time like this. I'll tell him to stop honking that horn, Dad. Please do, Jonathan. Yes, please, please do. I'll call down to him. I'll tell him to stop. Hey, hey, Mike, Mike. So where you are, Jonathan? Cut off that horn. Didn't I tell you this guy was sick? But we're going to be late for work. I'll be down in a few minutes. Take it easy. You better hurry up. I wouldn't want to be late, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't want to be late, Jonathan. Who is this, Mike? Did he cause any trouble? Oh, no, Father. He, he won't cause any trouble. Well, you've got to be careful, son. He wouldn't understand. There aren't many who would understand. You've got to be careful. I only did as you said, Dad. I made friends with one of the old timers down to plant. I drive him to work every night. He works in the same unit with me. Now I can't get rid of him. You sure about him, kid? Sure, sure, I'm sure about him. Well, what does he think you're doing up here? Well, I told him a friend of mine lives here. Sick friend. It's all right, Dad. Very well. How's it coming, Gus? Almost finished. Gus was a mechanic. An old timer. My father had real respect for his ability. Gus had chipped out the inside of the thermos bottle. Now he was working on the detonator. Looks like the old-fashioned pocket watch my dad wore. Now Gus started winding it. Somehow, that kind of got me. I wish my father had never started this thing. I wish he didn't believe the way he did about atomic fission destroying the world. I wish he was like everybody else. That I wasn't his son. Hey, Jonathan, what time you got? Huh? What time do you have? What's the matter with you? Are you getting too nervous for me, son? Nervous? Oh, don't worry about me being nervous. It's, uh, uh, 829. 829. Okay, kid. <laughs> what are you sweating about? Who, me? Your dad ain't sweating. <laughs> this is no time to be nervous, Jonathan. She'll go off at 630 tomorrow morning. Is that okay? Fine, Gus, fine. Okay, kid? Sure. Okay. Now Gus cleared a little space on the table and went to a steel cupboard. He came back with a metal jug cradled in his arm. My father leaned forward. I felt myself tightening up inside. Without thinking about it, I pulled a pack of cigarettes out of my jacket, put one in my mouth. Then as I was about to strike the match, Gus looked up. My father started coming toward me, the veins throbbing in his neck. Put that match away, you fool. What's what? wrong with you? Haven't you any sense at all? Well, well, what do you mean? You tell him, Gus. A kid, if one spark gets into this nitro, they won't find enough of us here to fill that matchbox. Oh, the unlit cigarette turned to garbage in my mouth. I spit it out and stamped it to pieces on the cement floor. <laughs> my father and Gus looked at each other. Gus grinned. My father's face, stone hard, didn't change. He looked at me like I was still a little boy. Okay, okay, they'd find out. When the nighttime came at the plant, it'd be up to me. Your lunch, kid. Here it is. I just bought it this afternoon. Oh, look how pretty it is. It's a shame to spoil it. All right, finish with it, Gus. This is not a time for jokes funny about Gus and his jokes. He didn't believe in this thing at all. He'd sell out to anybody. Money. Just give him money. But you had to admire what he could do. He opened the lunch kit and took the bottle out. He screwed the detonator into the cap, and when it fitted right, he laid it aside. Then he put a siphon into the thermos bottle and opened the jug of nitroglycerin. He poured out a thick, yellowish liquid. And when the thermos bottle was full, 
He put the top on the jug and carried it back to the cupboard. You better be far away when this goes off, kid. I'll be far away, all right. Jonathan is a bright boy, Gus. I've taught him well. Gus didn't say anything after that. He bent down over his table and his eyes tightened up till you could barely see him. He worked quick. You could see he knew what he was doing. And watching him, I began to feel better. Then he was finished. He put the thermos bottle of nitro back inside the lunch kit and the sandwich and the orange. Then he closed the lunch kit and handed it to me. Here you are, kid. Don't drop it. I won't. <laughs> now, son... Yes, Dad. Look at me. Dad, look back at me. Yes. It will all work out all right, won't it, son? Yes, Dad. It'll be all right. You will make no mistakes. I'll be careful. And you'll be here tomorrow morning? I'll be here. Good. And then perhaps we'll go away together, you and I. That'll be fine. Oh, there's your friend again. All right, Jonathan, get on with it. Before the old fool gets us all into trouble. We got to talking. He's pretty sick. We're going to be late for work. Well, you should have taken a bus. What about you? I'd have been late. So what? So what? That ain't no attitude. All Jonathan. right, all right. Here. Open up the dashboard compartment. I want to put this lunch kit in. Okay. Be careful. Well, it's a nice new one. The drive to the plant was something I'd never forget. What if I ran into something? A tire blew. A speck of dust got into my eye and I ran off the road. I stayed off the main highway. Too much traffic. This ain't the right road, Jonathan. I drove under 25 miles an hour all the way. Can't you go any faster? We're going to be late, Jonathan. And all the time the old man kept talking, talking. You young fellas of today, you're a strange, disturbing lot. Talk, talk, talk. You've a fever in your blood. You're restless and you don't know why. You're a strange lot. Yeah, 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 a strange lot. You've a fever in your blood. You, Keep you're... quiet. What's that? What? The noise. That rattling. Oh, I don't know, Jonathan. Sounds like your lunch kit. Come here. What are you worrying about that for? We're going to be late. Stop telling me we're going to be late. Stop that jabbering. Yes, Jonathan. You, you think the lunch kit will be all right now? You packed it in pretty well. Okay. If you hear it rattling again, let me know right away. You hear, Mike? <laughs> We came to the plant. The night shift guys were already at work. The parking lot was jammed with their cars. We were late, but I was glad of that. Now I'd be able to park near the entrance. Later on, I'd be able to get out in a hurry. Okay, Mike, this is it. I'm I'm sorry I made you late. Oh, that's all right, Jonathan. Uh, mind if I go back with you in the morning? Okay. Just be here prompt. I won't wait for you. I took the lunch kit and started for the main gate. The guard was standing there, inspecting everybody with a flashlight. I grinned at him and snapped the lunch kit open. How are you tonight? Okay. Not eight much, are you? No. Not much. Ought to. Put some weight on you. <laughs> Pass. I changed my clothes quickly and left the lunch kit in my locker. I figured I must look pretty haggard. So before going into the plant, I went to the washroom and washed my wrists. Then I saw I left my wristwatch in my street clothes. It was against the rules to go back into the locker room until the ship was over. Now all night long, I wouldn't know what time it was. I have to ask, have to guess. Oh, father wouldn't like that at all. Being so careless. I began noticing... Kind of an ache in the pit of my stomach. Oh, mustn't get sick tonight. I drank a lot of water, and the pain left me. Then I went back into my unit. All over the 
this was going to be a bad night. I was all raw nerves. It was like being in the middle of a nightmare. A nightmare that wouldn't end. My hands were all thumbs. I couldn't seem to make them do anything right. Oh, Father wouldn't like the way I was doing things. I couldn't stand it much longer. Hey, Jonathan! Huh? What are you doing? Cut your switch! What? What's wrong, Mr. Davis? What's wrong? Is that the way you handle that modifier? Where's your apron? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, gee, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Davis. Don't be sorry. Do it right. Get on the ball, Jonathan. Get on the ball. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. On the ball. What time was it getting to be? I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't think. All I could remember was what was in my locker. All I could remember was that thermos bottle filled at the top with nitro. All I could remember was a detonator set for 6.30. Hey, Mike, what time is it? 12.30. Hey, Mike, what time is it? Ten minutes after one. Hey, Mike, what time is it? Five minutes to two. Hey, Mike, what time is it? Almost time for lunch. Lunch? And am I hungry? I could eat them. Hey, what's wrong with you? Well, you're white, is it? My stomach. My stomach. Hey, you guys, come over here, quick! How do you feel now, Sam? Better. What time is it? Where am I? You're in the plant dispensary. You, uh, you ever had a spell like that before? No, no, I never did, Doc. What time is it? Hey, you're pretty nervous, aren't you? No, 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 I'm all right. I don't know. Your pulse was extremely high when they brought you in here. But I'm all right now, Doc. I want to go back to my job. You want to what? <laughs> I can't allow you to go back to your job, son. Now just relax. But I'm all right now. What, what time is Take it? Take it easy now. Take it easy. It's, uh, it's 2.30. 2.30? Well, they all going back to work. I won't be able to go to my locker. Oh, I, won't... I know what you're thinking. Your lunch. Isn't that what's on your mind? But lunch is over. I won't be able to go well, back. Now, to... never mind. I'll send somebody to get your lunch, kid. Oh, no. No, don't do that. Huh? No, no. No, really, doctor. I'm not hungry. Sure, I know, but you've got to have something. Uh, just sit there. He went into the next room. I want to jump up and start running. Oh, but that was no good either. Why, I made such a fuss about the lunch kid. What's he doing in there? And he came back. And he was carrying a glass of milk. Here you are. You're going to miss lunch. At least drink this. <laughs> milk. Go on. Drink it down. Okay. We'll finish it all. That's it. Feel better? Yeah. I think... I think I better go back to work. No, you don't want to do that. Just take it easy. Oh, I feel fine now. Really? <laughs> you couldn't go back to work even if I let you. What do you mean? You'll lie down on the cot there in the next room and take it easy. You're going to take a nice long sleep. Sleep? Why, sure. Oh, no, no. i got to get back to work. Oh, no. Not tonight anymore. But I couldn't sleep. You'll sleep all right. I put a couple of grains of barbitol in that milk you drank. Sleeping powder? Hey, what's the matter with you breaking the glass like that? I don't want to go to sleep. I'm all right. Oh, you're all right. Can't even hold a glass. Well, you're in fine shape. Well, at least you drank the milk. I don't like taking dope. Now, look, son, it'll slow you down. You'll wake up feeling like a new man. <laughs> you little fellas, you don't know how to relax. It's a wonder you live as long as you do. Now, come along with me. Just lie there now and behave yourself. That's right. Crawl under the blankets. Now, in a few minutes, you'll be sleeping like a baby. And you won't need the lights. Good night, young fellow. <laughs> Pleasant dreams. Suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Lund in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, 
Suspense. Sleeping powder. He put sleeping powder in the milk. And like an idiot, I drank it all down. Every bit of it. And then... And I started to get drowsy. With a time bomb in my lunch kit set to go off in just a few hours, I started getting drowsy. No. No, I had to get up. To get out. I couldn't stay there. I couldn't sleep through. I had to do something. Something. My eyes were getting heavy. So heavy. I couldn't keep them open. Kind of pure nitro. And all the chemicals and inflammable stockpiles here place would go up like an ammunition dump. I had to get out. I couldn't, couldn't keep my eyes up. So easy. It's so easy. I let my eyes close. Go to sleep. No. No. I couldn't go to sleep. I couldn't. I couldn't. I crawl off the cot. Window in the room. I have to get through the window. I couldn't go through the doctor's office. Get out through the window. I started over. But then, then I... Stop. And sit down. So tired. So tired. So good to sit there. So good to close. I slept right through, and then the whistle woke me up. It woke me up. Oh, well, lucky. I'm lucky. Six o'clock. The lunch kit goes off at 6.30. I have to act fast. This time, no mistake. Now, now I have to do everything right. Getting out of the dispensary was easy. There was a shed right below the window. I dropped to the roof. And into the ground. Didn't feel any too good. Still groggy from the barbasol. There was no time to think about that now. When I got back to the locker room, the boys were climbing out of their work clothes, getting ready for the shower room. Hey, Jonathan, you okay now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I feel fine. Hey, you better stop drinking that turpentine, Jonathan. <laughs> Boy, you sure had me worried, Jonathan. Oh, I'm all right now, Mike. Do I still get the ride? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, see you later, then. Gonna take a shower. I changed into my street clothes and nothing flat. Not caring how I looked. I was kind of worried the doctor would look in on me and find me gone. When I was ready to go, all the other fellows were in the shower room. Oh, that was the break I wanted. I took the lunch kit out of my locker and slid it underneath. And I looked at my wristwatch. Four minutes after six. I had 25 minutes to get away. It was working out fine. Now I knew Father would be pleased. I walked past the front offices. No one else around yet. I couldn't walk too fast, though. Not too fast. Not too slow. That natural. Not too fast. Not too slow. Oh, uh, Jonathan. Huh? That's Mr. Davis. The foreman. How are you feeling now, gentlemen? Oh, I'm all right, Mr. Davis. Anyhow, I want to talk to you. Come into the office. Now? Sure, now. Oh, well, I'm in kind of a hurry, Mr. Davis. At six o'clock in the morning, nobody's in a hurry. Come on, come in. All right, but just for a minute. Close the door. Sit down. Uh, nothing like sitting down and relaxing after a long night. Yeah, I could use a little oil. I really can't stay long, Mr. Davis. I'm uh, I'm, I'm supposed to meet someone. <laughs> At six o'clock in the morning? You still look pale, Jonathan. You sure you feel all right? Yes, yes. Mr. Davis, if it's about the mistake I made tonight... Oh, well... it's not that so much. I'm just a little worried about your health. <laughs> There's nothing to worry about, Mr. Davis. It's just that, well, sometimes I get a little nervous. A little nervous? Look at you, squirming on that chair. You're a bundle of nerves. Something, something bothering you? I mean, something really bothering you? You can't relax. Nothing's bothering me. Well, just to make sure, I'm going to call the dispensary. 
I've got a hunch you're not telling me everything. I tell you, I'm all right. A uh, dispensary, please. Jonathan! Jonathan, come back here! What's wrong with that guy? He wasn't taking me. I looked at my watch. 6.14. Still plenty of time to get away. I left the main building and started across the yard to the gate. It was still dark. I was one of the first out. Hey, you! Don't look back. Don't look back. Keep going. Don't let them stop you. Hey, slow down! Slow down! Bob, I gotta chase you. I'm all out of breath. What do you want? You know as well as I what I want. You forgot something. What did I forget? You forgot to punch the time clock. I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow? That'll be my neck. You're not leaving this plant till you punch out, mister. All right, all right. I'll go back and punch out. Where's the fire? Where's the fire? You ought to work out that energy at your job, young fella. Yeah, yeah. I went back into the main building. And there was at least 20 other guys waiting in line before the clock. Say, hey, look. I, uh, I gotta get to town early. How about let me punch out now, huh? End of the line, bud. But it'll only take a second. End of the line. We all want to get to town early, bud. Okay, okay. Still had time. Still had time. Still had time. Hi there, Jonathan. Hello. Say, I think Mike's looking for you. Yeah? yeah the old guy sort of adopted you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> sure a good long line tonight, eh? Yeah. Well, not so much to do at six o'clock in the morning. My missus will be asleep when I get off. Oh. How are you feeling now? Huh? Oh, okay. Say, is my watch right? I got 621. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, 620 I got. <laughs> you sure figure it out to the minute. Right to the minute. Here's my card. Okay. <laughs> Flock of guys were out by now. It was kind of cold. It took a couple of seconds for the motor to turn over. It was 6.27. I had three minutes. Three minutes. Couldn't waste any time. I was fighting for my life. Finally caught. Started backing out quick. Had it out in a hurry. Three minutes. Less than that now. Oh! Hey! Hey, look out! Oh, my headlights. What's the matter with you? Come out and see what you did to my headlights. I'm sorry. I'll pay for them. Oh, that ain't the idea. Why don't you watch where you're going? All right, here's my driver's license. Uh, I work in Unit 5. I'll see you tonight and we'll, we'll work something out. My name is Jonathan Peters. Hey, hey, not so fast. Not so fast. I got to write this down. You got a pencil? Here's my pen. Well, start writing. All right. Jonathan Peters. Unit 5. Yes. Okay, here's your pen. I'll see you tonight. You ought to watch where you're going this time of the morning. Back up and let me out, will you, fella? I'm in a hurry. Oh, you guys, always in a hurry, always in a hurry. That's our trouble, son. All right, it's clear now. Thanks. No more than two minutes. I gotta hurry, hurry. Clear now. All clear. Hurry, hurry. Wait for me! Wait! Wait, Jonathan! Oh, he got away. Now, why'd he do that? These young fellas don't know what the end will be. Uh, that kid sure is wacky. In a hurry. Always in a hurry. Hey, what's the matter with him? Uh, no sense of responsibility. Last night he drives like a turtle. This morning he races out of here like a demon and leaves me standing. Uh, too bad, Mike. Well, maybe somebody else will give you a ride home, huh? Oh, I can get a bus, but this will teach me to do a guy a favor. What do you mean? Well, that Jonathan. I didn't want to keep him waiting, so I came out and looked for him, and he's not in the car. So I go back in the plant to look, and I miss him. When I get back, he's driving off. Yeah? So what's the failure did him? Uh, he was so darn particular about it. Then he goes off and leaves it under his locker. But I found it and put it in his car for him. What? His lunch kit. I put it in his car. Hey, what was that? Funny. Sounded like thunder. Thunder? 
look at the sky. Yeah, beautiful. No, it couldn't have been thunder. It's going to be a real nice day. Radio England UK 2. Radio England UK 2. Mystery in the Air. Starring Peter Lorre. Radio England UK 2. Radio England UK 2. And our bank has now opened a branch near the cemetery in Dublin because they said, if you can't take it with you, this is a chance to be near it. <laughs> To atone for an act of disrespect shown to his teacher, an Indian named Andrana traveled from Madura to the holy town of Badrinath on the Tibetan border, a distance of 1,600 miles in four years. Instead of walking, he would fall continuously on the ground, rise and fall again for the entire journey. On the return trip, he neither sat or lay down, but slept, tied to a post, believe it or not. <laughs> Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to juvenile detail. You get a report that a teenage boy has been found in a downtown alley. He's in critical condition. Your job? Check it out. It was Wednesday, November 16th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of juvenile detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Powers. My name's Friday. We're on our way into the office, and it was 9.17 p.m. when we got to the second floor of Georgia Street Juvenile. The squad room. I don't know, Joe. What? You see a kid like that, you start wondering. Yeah. Fifteen years old, trying to hold up a liquor store. Kind of worries the guy. What do you mean? What about your own kids? How are they going to turn out? Well, most of them turn out okay. Yeah, can't help worrying, though. Well, you're a father. Maybe you're better off, Joe, not having the worries. You really believe that? Well, I guess so. Well, why don't you stop trying to marry me off? Oh, say, that reminds me. Yeah. You know the Phillips live down the street from us? I don't think I do. They were over for dinner the same night you were. Yeah. Last summertime, Faye made fried chicken. Oh, yeah. Remember it? I remember the chicken. Go ahead. You're going to spend Christmas with us, aren't you? Christmas. Faye told me to be sure and remind you. It's only a month or so off. That's soon, huh? Yeah. Can we count on you? Yeah, if we're not working. Swell. I'll let Faye know. What's this got to do with the Phillips? Mm, nothing. Mm-hmm. It's got nothing to do with them, Joe. Why are you so darn suspicious? Which one of them has the sister? Huh? Come on, Mr. and Mrs., which one? Both of them, for all I know. Well, which one has a sister who's coming out here for the holidays? Which one? Mrs. Phillips. And they're all going to be at your place for Christmas dinner, is that it? Well, Faye hasn't asked them yet. She wanted to be sure that you... Mm -hmm. Okay to ask them? They're your friends. You won't regret it, Joe. You know Mrs. Phillips is darn nice looking. Good talker to her. For sisters, anything like Just she... Just do me one big favor, will you? What's that? Christmas is still five weeks away. Don't start selling me now. <sighs> I wouldn't try to sell you on any girl. You know that. You bet. I never even met this one. I was just thinking that sometimes you can kind of sort of judge a person by family and... Doing on Friday. Where's that? I see. Yeah. Found a kid lying in an alley off Sheridan Street. He's hurt pretty bad. An accident? Knife in his back. Frank and I drove out to the address where the victim had been found. It was a dark alley that opened onto Sheridan Street in the block between 5th and 6th. An ambulance had been called, and the boy had already been moved to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. 9.42 p.m., we talked to one of the patrol car officers who had discovered the body. We're only a couple blocks away. We headed right over. Where'd you find him? Yeah, I'll show you. Right here against that wall. Mm-hmm. Must have lost a lot of blood. Yeah. Knife still in him? Mm-hmm. Small of the back. Looked like he'd been beat up, too. You say anything about who did it? Well, he mumbled something. We couldn't understand him, and then he passed out. How old would you say he was? 
Oh, 15, 16, maybe. Uh-huh. He's a good-looking kid, about 5'8", black hair, blue eyes, regular features. What kind of clothes? A jeans and a jacket, windbreaker type. See anybody around who might have done it? No, not a soul. The street was deserted. Uh-huh. My partner's out looking now. I'll give him a hand. All right. Who filed a complaint? I don't know. Well, we'll check the board. I'm afraid that won't help. Hmm? Well, they don't know either. While a patrol car officer searched the neighborhood for suspects, Frank and I canvassed the area for the person who had reported the crime. 10, 16 p.m., we talked to the patrons in a nearby bar and grill. They denied having any knowledge of the assault. 10, 42 p.m., we entered a small tobacco shop on the corner of Sheridan and 8th. Evening, gents. How are you, sir? How are you, sir? Uh, hi. What can I do for you? We're police officers. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Sam Crest here. Mr. Crest. Uh, something troubling you fellas? I'd like to talk to you for a minute, that's all. Done anything I shouldn't? No, sir, not as far as we know. Well, you never can tell, you know. The, the way they keep making up new laws nowadays, a person can be a criminal without even half trying. Mm-hmm. Too many rules. That's what's wrong with this country. Too darn many rules. Yes, sir. Ought to be just one. How's that? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Golden rule. That ought to be more than sufficient. Yeah. Don't work out that way, though. Man could live up to it every day of his life and still wouldn't keep him out of jail. Mm-hmm. Golden rule don't say nothing about paying income taxes or taking out licenses or filing Social Security reports. Well, does it? No, doesn't seem to. But you're in jail if you don't do them. Yeah. Man can live by the golden rule. Don't make no difference. It makes a difference. Oh, some maybe, but not enough. Have you been here all evening, Mr. Crest? Since supper time. When was that? 6.30. Eat at the drugstore over on Soto Street. Stop serving food at 7. I see, sir. What time did you get back to the store, do you remember? Oh, five odd, maybe. And you've been here ever since? Sure. You ain't doubt my word. No, sir. I tell the truth, you know. Yes, sir. I may not get all my government forms figured out right, but I'm a truthful man. Mm-hmm. Anybody suspicious come in here tonight? Suspicious? Mm-hmm. I'm afraid you'll have to explain that. You see, I ain't no policeman. Folks don't look suspicious to me. They just look like folks. Well, any strangers, then? Sure, lots of strangers. Eight or ten, maybe. I see. Strangers to me, leastways. I don't get acquainted with folks easy. Uh-huh. Man comes, buys a pack of cigarettes or some tobacco. Don't make him a friend. Uh-huh. Well, now, sir, most of tonight's customers have been in before. Oh, well, some of them had, yes. Yeah. Some of them had. I don't keep track. I see. Did you hear anything out on the street? Traffic. Folks walking by. You fellas sure ain't very specific. Well, anything like a fight? In front of my place? In the neighborhood. Well, I didn't hear no fight. Somebody get to mixing it up? Looks that way. Oh, yeah, that's the trouble with this world. People always squabbling. Wherever you go, whatever you do, it ends up in squabbling. Mm. Who was it? We don't know yet. Anybody hurt? Yes, sir. Well, probably brung it on himself. Maybe. Were there any youngsters hanging around your place tonight, Mr. Crest? Youngsters? Teenagers. Well, if there was, I didn't notice them. Kids, huh? Yes, sir. Well, I just don't know what we're coming to. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Good night. Good night, sir. Uh, say, uh, there was one. How's that? One young fella. Uh, he didn't hang around, though. Uh, he was in a big rush. You know him? No, I, no, I, I don't think I ever saw him before. Could you describe him for us? Oh, just an ordinary kid. How big was he? Oh, not big. He come up to about uh, here on me. Mm-hmm. Probably don't have his full growth yet. I see. You recall how he was dressed? Well, I didn't pay much attention, only in the shop a couple of minutes. What color was his hair? Light, reddish, or blondish. Nice looking boy? Oh, no better or worse than most. What time did you see him? Must be nearly a couple of hours ago, along about uh, nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. Come charging in all out of breath. Yeah. Asked if I had a phone. I pointed out the booth over there in the corner. Go ahead. Well, there's nothing more to tell. He run over the booth, made a call. Wasn't on the phone more than a few seconds. Mm-hmm. Then he come out and left the shop. Anything else you can tell us about him? Mm, I don't think so, no. Except that uh, when he was leaving... Yeah. Uh, he wasn't in a hurry like when he come in. He... Sort of peered out the door first. Mm-hmm. Seemed as though all the steam had gone out of him. He looked back over his shoulder. Yes, sir. Doggonest expression on his face. What do you mean? Like he was scared to death. While we're in 
the tobacco shop, we telephoned Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and talked to Dr. Sebastian. He told us that the victim was in a critical condition and had been moved to General Hospital. He also told us that they'd not been able to identify the boy. We called General and asked to be notified when he was able to talk. 11.31 p.m., Frank and I went back to the office. Homicide was notified. The patrol car officers who had discovered the body reported that they had not found any suspects in the vicinity of the crime. 11.46 p.m., we checked with the crime lab. An examination of the weapon had revealed no useful fingerprints. It was a spring blade knife with an eight-inch blade. 12.02 a.m., Frank and I went off duty and another team of detectives continued the investigation. The next morning, Thursday, November 17th, 8.12 a.m. Morning, Joe. Hi. Anything new? No, not so far. How about missing persons? Nobody's reported them. It's funny. You'd think somebody'd be looking for him by now, his folks or somebody. Yeah, you would. Mm-hmm. Any coffee in that thing? Yeah, help yourself. All right. Probably cold by now. Better than nothing. Did you miss breakfast? Yeah, I wasn't hungry. Oh. Oh, you're right. Huh? It's cold. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Mm-hmm. Uh, about Christmas? What about it? Well, we won't invite Mrs. Phillips' sister if you don't want us to. Mm-hmm. No. I got to thinking last night people shouldn't force a guy to get married and raise a family if it's against his best judgment. Well, who's getting married and raising a family? It's just a Christmas dinner, huh? Yeah, but you know Faye. Well, you know me. I got it. Juvenile Friday. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Thank you very much. General Hospital, the boy's coming, too. Huh? Can we talk to him? Yeah, for a minute or two. We better get a move on. Oh? Huh? Doc said to hurry. Frank and I drove out to General Hospital. The doctor in charge of the case was waiting for us in the hall outside the patient's room. Smith and Friday? Yes, sir. Is it all right to go in? Don't stay too long. All right. You're going to be all right, Doc? It's too soon to tell. If the wall was an inch higher, I could give you an answer. Yeah? It'd be dead. <laughs> We went on into the room. The shades were drawn and the victim was in semi-darkness. His eyes were open, but he closed them as soon as he saw us enter. How are you feeling, son? Son? I'm okay. I'd like to talk to you for a couple of minutes. No way of stopping you, is there? What's your name, son? What's yours? Smith, Frank Smith. My partner's Joe Friday. Cops? That's right. Well? Well, what? How about telling us who you are? I forgot. Well... You know, I'm Yeah. How'd you get hurt, kid? Forgot that, too. We're trying to help you, son. It's not my fault if I don't remember nothing. You know, you're pretty sick. Sure. But it's not amnesia. You a duck? No. Nope. And you tell what's wrong with me. Who knifed you? Now, what happened? Come on, what's your name? Abraham Lincoln. You guys can call me Abe. All right, we'll find out. Go ahead. What were you doing on Sheridan Street last night? Not where I was. You want him to get away with it? Who? The fellow that stuck a shiv in your back? No, don't do a thing like that. That's what we want you to tell us. Hey, you know what? Hmm? It's all starting to come back to me. Tell us about it. There was this black sedan, see? Mm Mm-hmm. Great big job. Yeah. I was walking along the street, sedan pulled up beside me, 12 guys jumped out. Yeah. Told you it was a big job. Mm Mm-hmm. Six of them tried to grab me. All right, that's enough. But you want to know what happened. It was all wearing masks. I said that's enough. Sure. Now, you listen to me, son. We're going to find out who you are and who stabbed you. Sorry, I ain't in a position to offer a reward. You want your face in all the newspapers? What for? I ain't important. I said we're going to find out who you are. Well? Okay, if you want to play detective. Let's have it. Tom. Tom what? Mark Hutt. Where do you live? Diamond Street. What number? Apartment house, corner of Diamond Olympics, second floor in the back. Now, I suppose you tell us what happened last night. Guy jumped me, that's all I know. Who was he? I don't know. I never saw him before. You sure about that? Yeah. What did he look like? I don't know. It was dark. Somebody your own age? Heck no. How old was he? 30, 35. Why'd he pick you? I don't know. Must have thought I had some dough. You never saw him before? That's what I said. How tall was he? I don't know. Did you get a look at his face? Uh Uh-uh. Can you tell us anything about him? Nope. But you know how old he was. I got a feeling, that's all. Yeah. Where do you go to school? Taylor High. What year? Tenth. Any gangs in your school? I don't know. You don't belong to one, do you? Nope. You had any kind of trouble lately? What kind of trouble? With the other kids at the school. 
Did you guys get anything straight? It wasn't a kid. Mm -hmm. Who do you live with, Martha? My old man. Where's your mother? Under a tombstone. We'll get in touch with your dad. What for? He might be worried about you. Want to bet. Unable to get any additional information from the victim. We went back to the office and checked the name Tom Market through R and I. They had nothing on him. Nine forty seven AM. Frank and I drove out to the address he'd given us. It was a two story stucco apartment house, badly in need of repair. We went up to the second floor. Must be this one, yeah. I don't hear anybody. Take it easy, William. All right. It's all the pound for. Market? Yeah? We're police officers. Frank Smith, my name's Friday. Well, what do you want? Come in for a minute. If you don't, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Oh, boy. My head's coming apart in shreds. Mm -hmm. Kind of tied one on last night. That's so? Haven't got an aspirin, have you? No, sir. Right not. Can of beer? No. Nope. No. Nope. That's what I really need. <laughs> Usually keep a couple in the refrigerator for an emergency like this. Mm -hmm. But that kid of mine's been guzzling him again. But I talked to you about your son, Mr. Market. <clears throat> yeah? You know he didn't come home last night. Didn't he? No. Nope. No way of me knowing it. I work nights, drive a hack, don't get home before five. He leaves for school before I wake up. I see. What'd you pick him up for? He's not under arrest. Huh? He's in the hospital. Hospital? That's right. He was stabbed last night. Huh? Yeah. He's going to be all right, ain't he? They don't know yet. Oh. We thought you might be able to help us. Help you? Yeah. Find out who did it. You know who your son's friends are? I don't know nothing about them. We don't... Well, we aren't very close. I see. Has he been worried lately about anything? Upset? Uh, no more than usual. How's he doing in school? Lousy. Well, oh. they always ask me to come down and talk to him. Principal, his teacher. What do they say about him? I don't go. Mm -hmm. I went a couple of times when he first came to live with me. Didn't do any good. That's so. I can't change him. Anything I tell Tom just rubs him the wrong way. So he's on his own. How long has your son lived with you? Three years. How about before that? He was with his mom. Yeah. She divorced me a couple of years after he was born. Took him with her. Mm -hmm. When she died, there was nobody else to look after him. He had to come back to me. Yeah. <clears throat> I got to get me a glass of water and only take a second. Yeah. Looks like the kid was right. Huh? About his father. Maybe. She doesn't seem very upset. No. He just got to stop his drinking. Yeah. Never used to feel like this when I was younger. Is that right? Could go on a bat for two, three days, come out of it and feel okay. Can't take it anymore. Officer, we'll be leaving. If you'd like to see your son, he's at General Hospital. Tom asked to see me? He's pretty sick, Market. You talked to him, didn't you? That's right. He asked to see me? No, he didn't. I didn't think so. I guess I can't blame him for hating me. He figures I didn't want him after his mom died. Figured I had to take him. Yeah. Tried to tell him different. He didn't believe me. We just can't talk, Tom and me. Mm -hmm. Father and son living in the same apartment. Like we speak a different language. Think I'd go down and see him? Well, that's up to you. Be a nice for me. It's funny. There was somebody who hates you, your own son. Well, maybe you're wrong about him. Yeah, I see it in his face, his eyes, the way he talks. Every time I look at him, I can see it. But Tom's the one who's wrong. Yeah. It's not his fault, but he's wrong. You wouldn't believe it on a stack of Bibles. Even you guys don't. What's that? That I love him. Frank and I drove out to the Taylor High School on Grand Avenue. 10.57 a.m., we interviewed the principal, James Wingor. He told us that Tom Market was a poor student and that he was difficult to manage. He also told us that the boy had a good mind and was capable of much better work than he performed. He was unable to throw any light on the knifing and suggested that we talk with the victim's homeroom teacher, Miss Nora Rollins. 11.16 a.m., we interviewed Miss Rollins in a small room which adjoined the principal's office. I'm supposed to be giving an English examination during this period, Sergeant. Yes, ma'am. This will only take a couple minutes. You have a student named Tom Marcotte? Certainly. He's in my homeroom. What kind of a boy is he? Noisy. Lazy. Impossible to discipline. Similar to a number of the others. Mm -hmm. He's absent today, though. Yes, ma'am. We know. Has something happened to Tom? He's had an accident. An accident or a fight. Why do you say that? Huh. Wouldn't be the first time. Has he had any fights lately? Came to school with a cut lip two or three weeks ago. Does Tom have any particular enemies? I really don't know. 
There are over 75 students in my homeroom. It's a little difficult to know very much about any of them. Yes, ma'am. How about friends? Who's he pal around with, do you know? Nobody in particular, as far as I can tell. It... No, wait a minute. There's one boy. Ma'am? Arthur Jollett. What does he look like? Well, he's small, red-haired, almost as troublesome as Tom. Is he in school today? I believe so. Well, ma'am, is there anything else you can tell us about Tom? No. Except that I don't have much hope for him. How's that? Well, I've asked his father to come in and see me several times. So far, he's always declined the invitation. Well. Yeah. Is Tom badly hurt? Yes, ma'am, pretty bad. What was it? Knife wound. No. Oh. Seventeen years ago, when I first started teaching, that would have shocked me. I see. It was a very naive young lady, Sergeant. Is that right? I thought all a person had to do to become a teacher was to take the right courses, get a degree, and a credential. Mm-hmm. It seemed such a simple matter. I wanted to teach English literature, so I studied English literature. Shakespeare, Chaucer, Browning, Keats, Shelley. Yes, ma'am. As I continue in the profession, I discover that I omitted one essential course. What's that? Judo. We asked Mr. Wingor if we could interview the student named Arthur Jollett. He asked his secretary to have the boy sent into us. Sounds like he's the one who called in the report. Yeah, must have been with Mark that when it happened, huh? Come in. You want to see me? That's right. Come in, son. You're Arthur Jollett, huh? Ain't that who you asked for? Sit down, son. We're police officers. This is Smith. My name's Friday. You have a friend named Tom Marcott? I know him. Pretty good friend of yours, is he? He's a friend. You been with him lately? When? Yesterday, day before? Sure. Where? Here. We've got some of the same subjects. How about after school? Uh-huh. You saw him after school, did you? Night before last. Last night, too? Uh-huh. Where were you last night? Movie. Well, who'd you go with? Went alone. What movie? Double Bill in Hollywood. What'd you do afterward? It's to ride home. Spend any time around Sheridan Street? Where's that? You want us to show you? Huh? Come on, we'll take you over there. What for? I'd like to have you meet a man who runs a tobacco shop in that part of town. <laughs> you kidding or something? Young fellow came into his place last night. So? The way you described him, it could be you. He must be blind or something. Well, let's find out. Come on. Come on, sir. Okay, so maybe I was in his neck of the woods. What's the beef? Your friend Market was around there, too, wasn't he? Coincidence? Yeah. What's the matter with Tom, anyhow? Why? He ain't been in school today. He's in the hospital. Oh. It's a good thing you called us when you did. He might be dead by now. Who says I called you? man who runs the tobacco shop. How there could he tell it? The... Well, I mean, who I was calling. All right, Jollop. Give us the whole story now, will you? What story? Come on, let's get it over with. If it's about Tom, ask him. We're asking you. You want us to take you in? Of course not. It's up to you. Ain't much to tell. We're just walking around, Tom and me. Yeah. The fellow jumped out from an alley, came at us with a knife. Go ahead. Took a swing at Tom. I ducked off. Yeah. Called the cops. That's all I know. Who was it, Joe? Your guess is as good as mine. We don't think so. Suit yourself. I thought Tom was a friend of yours. He is. Well, we want to know who stabbed him. What do you expect me to do? Dream up a name? How big was he? Medium size. How old? 19, 20. Tom says he was about 35. Tom ought to know. He's a lot closer to him. All right. Let's go down to the juvenile bureau. Oh, I told you everything I know. I want to show you some mug shots. Forget it. I wouldn't recognize his picture. Let's give it a try anyway. I'll take it easy, will you? What's the matter? I don't want to be seen leaving with you guys. Is that right? Wouldn't do my reputation any good. Who are you afraid of? I ain't afraid. The guy who knifed your buddy? Is that who you're afraid of? Look, if Tom wanted you to know, he'd have told you, wouldn't he? Tom ain't dead. All right, come on, John. Let's go. Give me an answer. Is Tom okay or not? Does that make any difference to you? Sure, it makes a difference. It doesn't look like it to us. I'm no squealer. All right, you've had your chance. Now you got to go in. Come on. You can't arrest me. A boy was stabbed last night. You saw it. As far as we know, you're the only other person who was there. Now you figure it out. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Tom will tell you so. You throw me in jail, my old man will kill me. Well, that's tough. I ain't going to take the rap. It's up to you. Okay. Okay, it was Jerry. Jerry who? Longer. You go to this school? Yeah. What was it all about? Uh, Tom tried to date Jerry's girl. Jerry heard about it. Followed us last night. I'll get a hold of Longer. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. If Jerry finds out I squealed on him, he'll do even worse to me. He ain't going to find out, is he? We won't tell him. If it tumbles, you can start sending flowers. Jerry's the big man around school. Yeah. Or six foot, lots of muscle, lots of shove. Well, that doesn't make him a big man, does it? Huh? He needs a knife. The 
story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 2nd, a hearing was held in Juvenile Department, Superior Court, State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Petitions were filed on both the victim and the subject. The victim, Thomas Marcotte, was placed under 24-hour supervision in a foster home. The subject, Jerome Longren, due to a previous juvenile record and the viciousness of the attack, was sentenced to a juvenile correctional establishment. You have just heard Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action, and starring Jack Webb, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Radio England, UK 2. Countdown for blast off. X minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, X minus 1. Fire! From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years. On a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company presents... X. 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 Minus. 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 One. 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 Tonight's story, Mars is Heaven. When the first space rocket lands on Mars, what will we find? Only the ruins of a dead and deserted planet? Or will there be life... Intelligent life in some strange form that we can only imagine. Will we be welcomed with open arms? Or will the Martians treat us as invaders? Only one thing is certain. Someday, a giant metal ship will take off from Earth to travel through the black velocities, the silent gulfs of space to descend at last into the darkness of the upper Martian atmospheres. And on that day, man will finally know the answers. The day we first land on Mars. Now I hear this. Now I hear this. Approaching critical deceleration. Fasten gravity suits. Stand by to land. There it is. We've intersected the course vector, sir. All right, Mr. Lustig. Over to manual control. Aye, sir. Masters, sound general quarters. Aye, sir. What do you make of the terrain? There seems to be a heavy ground, Miss Captain. We won't be able to use the infrared lights. And we'll have to come in on radar. Isn't that a little risky, sir? Landing in the dark? I'd rather run the danger of a blind landing, Lieutenant, than come in without the cover of darkness. Remember, we don't know what kind of reception is waiting for us down there. Airspeed 500. Altitude now 4,000. Bridge to engine room. Stand by for deceleration. Fire forward tubes one and three. She goes, Mr. Lustig. There she goes, sir. Airspeed 100. Altitude 1,000. Radar indicates a level stretch dead ahead, sir. Skids down. Skids check. Altitude 500. 4. 350. 3. Up a point now. All right. Let's set her down. Five battle stations. I said, all secured, sir. 
Well, gentlemen. Gentlemen, we're now on Mars. April 20th, 1987. 4.33 Greenwich time. Enter that in the log, messers. I see. Well, gentlemen, it's less than two hours till dawn. As soon as it's light, we'll send out a landing party. Masters, get me an all-over hookup. <laughs> We're all set, Captain. Now hear this. All right, men. The smoking lamp is lit. Well, we're on Mars. The first man shipped from Earth to land here. We don't know what we're going to find or what dangers we may face. We're 17 men on an alien world. And it's up to us whether we ever get home again. The next few hours should tell the story. And I want instant obedience to all commands. I'll court-martial the first man who doesn't jump to when he's ordered. And one other thing. We may be on Mars, but this is still a United States naval vessel. Officers will conduct a personal and weapons inspection in one hour. That's all. Inspection, Captain. Now? Mr. Lustig, we've got an hour and a half to sweat out. Before we find out what's outside that airlock, I'd rather have a man worried about his stripes than about what's waiting outside on Mars. Now I hear this landing party report to forward airlock. Captain Black, Lieutenant Hingston, Lieutenant Lustig, and Dr. Horst report immediately to forward airlock. It's now landing time, minus five. Well, they're paging us. Uh, you ready, Dr. Horst? Yes, Mr. Lustig. As ready as I will ever be. Come on, let's get in the lock. Hingston, Lustig, and Horst reporting in the airlock. Very well, sir. The captain will join you. Four minutes to go. At least the captain would get here. What difference does it make? I just want to get it over with, that's all. Anybody got a cigarette? Yeah, I think you're smoking too much, Lieutenant Lustig. Are you nervous? I are for your horse. Wondering what's hidden outside underneath that ground mist? I've been giving it some thought. It'll be very interesting to find out. A very unusual planet, Mars. Why? It has an atmosphere. A wonderful thing, an atmosphere. Where you find one, you uh, find life. You mean Martians? What do you think they'll look like? Who knows? Intelligent life can take many forms. You mean they may have green skins and eyes on stalks or something? The comic book conception is possible, of course. Or they may have developed far beyond us. Perhaps they have a science that can produce weapons far more dangerous than our atomic missiles. You think we may have to fight our way out? After all, we are invaders. Now I hear this landing time minus two. All right, all right, we heard this. You know what I'd like to find outside that airlock? Good old Illinois. Ever been there, Lustig? Uh, only Chicago. You ought to see my hometown. Green lawns, big white houses. <laughs> Sounds like my hometown. My grandmother used to have one of those iron deer on the lawn. Every Halloween, we'd paint another color. One time, we painted it black and white like a Holstein cow. Where does your family live, Dr. Horst? I have no family. When I was a child, they were gassed to death in the Dachau concentration camp. Oh, tough. No, it has its advantages. I have no ties on Earth. Nothing to lose now. I imagine I'm the only one on board who is free to enjoy our present peculiar position. All right, masters, you can button it up now. Aye, aye, aye. Well, gentlemen, check your sidearms. In one minute, we'll be the first men to set foot on Mars. Quite an honor, eh? As long as the medals are not awarded posthumously. Still uneasy, Dr. Horst? Captain Black, I've been uneasy ever since I can remember. On Earth and on Mars. Well... 30 seconds. Give me the intercom phone, Lustig. Yes, sir. Masters. Aye, sir. Battle stations are to be manned till we return. If we're not back in two hours, I want no rescue party sent out. Blast off and save the ship, you understand? Aye, sir. All right. Five seconds. Four. Three. Two. 
One. Lustig, open the outer airlock. I see. It's fresh air. Let's go. All right, now, take it easy. It's too dark to move fast. Quiet, isn't it? Not even a wind. Can't see anything from this ground this time. We don't know what's out here. All right, come on. What the quiet? Captain, I can swear that... That sounds like a rooster. I don't hear it anymore. Very homely but unlikely sound. A rooster crowing on Mars? Kingston? I said... Set that machine gun 25 yards to the flank. We'll stay here till the ground mist lifts. I said... What do you make of the ground, horse? Grass. Plain grass. You can see some large foliage there where the mists thin down. What the... Kingston, hold your fire, you fool! I hit it, Captain! What? Some kind of wild animal. I hit it. I could see the traces, but it's still standing. Come on, horse. Doctor, where are you? Up ahead. Admiring the wild animal. Careful, Horst. Wait for us. Don't worry, Captain. <laughs> Some iron deer. A lawn ornament. Well, that, that's impossible. It's hollow. Interesting, isn't it? A whitewashed Victorian iron deer sitting on a lawn in the middle of Mars. I don't understand. Look around. The mist's lifting. Hey, Captain, look there. It's a house. A regular old-fashioned house. But, sir, on Mars... Good Lord. I haven't seen carved scrolls and gingerbread like that in years. Look at that port swing. The geraniums. There. I told you it was a rooster, Captain. Give me the glasses, Lustig. I want to take a look through that front window. Well, there's an upright piano. Some sheet music on it. Lustig, it's... It's beautiful Ohio. Oh, it can't be, sir. Horst... Horst, do you think the civilization of two planets could be identical? I don't know. That specific variety of geraniums is only 50 years old on Earth. Is it logical that they should develop in Mars? How about that porch swing of the piano in, in beautiful Ohio? Why, it's impossible. Captain Black, this looks like the town I was born in. Well, it, it looks like my hometown, too. I thought of something, sir. It's the only solution. Maybe, maybe we're not the first ship to reach Mars from Earth. Don't be ridiculous, Lustig. Oh, how else can you explain it? Uh, suppose some scientists got together. They, they, they invented some spaceship and, and planted a colony here. That's the only answer. That's impossible, Lustig. Been space travel, it couldn't be secret. Do you have any idea what ships cost, what industrial power is needed? No, there's got to be some logical reason. I think perhaps we might find out, Captain. The light just went on in that house. Kingston, cover that door with the machine gun. I see. All right, come on, horse. We're going to ring that doorbell. There's got to be a scientific answer to all this. And there's something moving in there. Stand back, Horst. Give me a clear shot. Are you sure a bullet can stop a Martian? Steady now. Can I help you? I... Well, we... If you're selling anything, it's much too early. No, 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 wait just a minute. What... What town is this? What do you mean? Are you census takers? No, no. We're strangers here. We want to know how this town got here. Is this a game? No, no, it's not a game. We're from Earth. From where? From Earth. Do you mean out of the ground? Are you sure you're feeling well? Madam, we came in a flying ship across space. We're from the third planet, Earth. This is Mars. Now do you understand Mars? You go away now, you hear? I'll call my husband from upstairs and he'll chase you. Go on. But this is Mars, isn't it? This is Green Lake, Wisconsin, in the United States of America. Bounded on the east by the Atlantic and on the west by the Pacific. Now go away. Goodbye. Horst, do you suppose it's really possible? I've got to find out more about this. I told you I'd call my husband. Now you go away. You've got to tell me one thing first. What year is this? Year? 1928, of course. For goodness sake. You hear that, Horst? And we know it's 1987. And we know this is Mars. Of course, is it possible that we got fouled up, made made some tremendous blunder, circled around and landed back on Earth? In 1928? Well, maybe some switch in time or dimension. Could we have shifted somehow, gone gone backward in time? Oh, Horst, this won't hold water. It's it's not logical. We've, we we checked every mile. We went past the moon, out into space. We're, we're on Mars. Lustig out at point. Kingston in the rear. Keep that gun at half load. I said... Horst, there, there's got to be some cold, logical solution. Captain... What? That, uh, that, that house down the street, the white one with the green shutters. Lustig, what's the matter? I never thought of... I never thought of... Thank God! Lustig! 
Lester, come back here. He's running for that house. That crazy fool after him, quick. Lester, stop. Come down off of that porch. Emma! 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 Lester, what the devil do you think you're doing? Albert! Oh, Grandma! And Grandpa, it is you. Lester, what is going on here? Albert, it's, it's been so many years. How you've grown, boy. It's so good to see you. Lieutenant Lester! Oh. Captain, uh, Grandma, I want you to meet my friends. This is Captain Black. Captain, I want you to meet my grandfather. Howdy. Any friend of Albert's is a friend of ours. How long have you been here, Grandma? Oh, a good many years. Ever since we died. Ever since you what? Oh, yes, sir. They've been dead 30 years. What? Oh, now, don't you trouble yourself. It's all right. We're alive again, that's all. Do you mean to tell me that Mars is heaven? Oh, nonsense, no. All we know is here we're alive again. And who are we to question God's infinite ways? Well, I... Lustig, we're going back to the ship. But, Captain, I, I want to talk to my grandfather. Lieutenant Lustig, I don't like any part of this. You'll come back with us if I have to club you and carry you. I see. Now, let's go. Heaven only knows what they've run up against back at the ship. Horse, look at that crowd around the ship. Looks like we're being welcomed with a celebration, Captain. Celebration, they've abandoned ship. Every port is open. No guard said. You, you masters. Hiya, Captain. Beat my old dad. Dad, that's Captain Black. I got a bad guy for an officer. Hingston! Uh, 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 what, sir? Bring that band back. Use force if you have to. I, uh, oh, excuse me, sir. There's my Uncle George. Hingston! I'll be right back, Captain Uncle George. Uncle George. What the devil is Don't going on here? Don't you understand, sir? They've all found friends and relatives. They're, they're all here. You're right, Captain. I've counted. The whole crew is out in the crowd. But I gave orders. Captain and orders. You don't understand, Captain. I understand mutiny. I don't care how many relatives show up. I'll have discipline. God. Johnny! What? Johnny, you old son of a gun. It's you. Edward. Yes. It can't be. Oh, of course it is. Johnny, Johnny, Ed. you won't. <laughs> Ed, what? Dr. Horst, this is my brother, Edward. How do you do? Hello, sir. It's wonderful to, to see you, Edward. <laughs> Look, I've, I've got to get back to my ship. Oh, Johnny, wait. I almost forgot. Mom's waiting at home. Mom? Yeah, and Dad, too. Mom and Dad are alive? Then... Then you're real, Ed. Well, of course. Don't I feel real? <laughs> I'm glad, huh? <laughs> Why, Ed? Ed! <laughs> we've, we've got lunch for you, Johnny. Mom's making corn fritters. Dr. Horst, haven't you found anybody? No, no, Captain. I have nobody. Well, then you come on home with me, right, Ed? Why, sure. Horst. Horst, you wouldn't believe it. But it's been 35 years since I had Mom's corn fritters. <laughs> By George, 35 years. Johnny. You too, Dr. Horace. Well, Johnny, you're still in the Navy, eh? That's right, Dad. I'm in command of the ship. We're an old Navy family, Dr. Horace. All three of our boys in the service. Yeah, Ed was the best pilot in the Pacific, too. What did happen, Ed? <laughs> What's the difference? I'm here now. Yeah, but... You know, it's almost perfect. All we're missing is your brother, Will. Then the whole family could be together. Well, it won't be long, Mom. Will's in charge of the XR-54. Next rocket coming out to Mars. Oh. Well, little Will. When does he leave, Johnny? Well, the takeoff's scheduled for September, but uh -huh. it depends on what we report. Oh, yeah. There's no question about that now, huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Christmas together again. That'll be something. Sure yes. will, yes, sirree. Well, uh, this calls for a celebration. How about a little of the old dandelion wine, eh, Johnny? Now, Father, don't you go giving Johnny too much wine. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big boy now, Mother. Well, sir, isn't everything just fine? Just fine. Again, will you, Ed? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Dr. Horst, what are you doing sitting over here alone? What do you think of my little family? Very nice. You know, I can't understand why you didn't find any folks here, Dr. Horst. It's just a shame everybody else is so happy. Well, I never remembered my family, Mrs. Black. All I know is they were gassed at Dachau during the Second World War. When I was liberated, I was in delirium three months. I cannot remember anything before then. A psychiatric phenomena. That's terrible. Isn't there anything anybody can do? I don't want to remember. I have not had a pleasant life. I prefer to be free of emotional entanglements. They interfere with a scientific approach. I'm sorry, Dr. Horst. Oh, I'll get it. That's our ring. Long and three shorts. I remember that. Well, maybe we'd better call it a night. You must be getting tired, Johnny. I'd better be going back to the ship. Nonsense. You stay the night. Uh, we insist. I just couldn't rest thinking of you all alone on that ship. Oh, I'm, I'll be all right. Well, good night. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Horst. That phone message was for you. Me? Yes, that's right. Uh, a message from Anna. Anna? I don't... Well, there. She must be an old friend. Isn't that nice? Uh, I don't... You sure it was for me? I don't remember any, Anna. Well, she asked if you were better. Perhaps she's someone who knew you at Dachau. Anna? She said she's coming over here first thing in the morning. So, you have to stay over. Yes, well, but that Dachau. settles it, then. You stay here, Horst. You can bunk with me in my old room. Yeah, but Johnny, we thought you'd like to be with Edward. So you could talk the way you're used to. Well, we can't put Dr. Horst on the day bed. I think we'd better share the room tonight. Be plenty of time for talking, Ed. <laughs> yes, I, I guess so. Well, I suppose I'd better drop back to the ship. You know, Ed, security check. What? Why do you have to do that here? I, I don't know, Mom. There's no good reason, I guess. <laughs> well, suppose we skip it tonight, eh? Huh? Well, good night, everybody. Oh, it's good to have you home, Johnny. It's good to be home, Mom. Black, hmm? You asleep? No, no, I've... I've been thinking about what we were expecting. <laughs> Green-skinned Martians. All the time there was only Mom and Dad and... and Edward waiting. Now, it's funny what tricks your imagination can play on you. Well, I guess Mars is heaven, Horst. You know, I've been thinking about Martians, too. Hmm? Captain, just suppose... Suppose... There were Martians, mm -hmm. and they saw us land. And suppose they thought of us as invaders. What would be the best weapon they could use against our atom bombs, huh? Oh, I don't see what you're getting at. They would want to disarm us first, huh? To wipe out all suspicion, to make us feel at home. Captain, mm -hmm. suppose this house isn't real. Suppose the people are just images, stolen from our own memories by Martians, created for us by telepathy. Oh, that's, that's the craziest theory I ever heard. Maybe that's why there was no one for me. Because in all my life, there is no happy memory, no real loved person, not even my mother. I don't remember her. Only the piles of rotting corpses of Dachau. There was no happy emotion for these people to recreate. How about that phone call? Anna? Yes, Anna. I didn't remember who she was, but I do now. I just remembered. When I was freed from Dachau, sick, delirious... I raved about a wonderful, kind nurse named Anna that took care of me. Well, there you are. It's logical. She's coming to see you tomorrow. But there was no Anna. I've been nursed by a man. What? Anna was only a dream. And there's only one way they could have learned about her. By reading my subconscious mind. That's impossible, Horace. Why? The whole crew was thinking of home. Suppose the Martians read our minds. Yes, but if, if there are Martians... If there are, they have us separated. Each man in a different house. Sleeping. Trusting. No one at the guns. I left my pistol downstairs. Do you think there's something to this, Horst? It's a perfect trap, Captain. Who would suspect his own mother? His grandparents? How easy. Just a knife in the heart of each sleeping man. That's impossible, Horst. But we've, we've got to get back to the ship. Listen. The crickets have stopped. Come on. 
We don't know when they change back to whatever they really are. All right, careful. Where are you going, John? Ahead. We, uh, we wanted a drink of water, that's... That's all, Ed. You're not thirsty, John. You don't want a drink. Look out! You don't want a His drink. His face! It's changing! He's a marshal! Run, horse! Run! You can't get away, John. This way, horse! Horse, where are you? Ah! Hello! Hello! Can you hear me, Earth? This, this is Captain John Black. The XR-53 calling for Mars. I blocked myself in the ship, but they've crippled it. I can't take off or fire the guns, and they're coming for me now. The Martians! I'm all alone here. All the rest are dead. Hinched and lusty. Dr. Horst. Poor Horst, he didn't even reach the door. Listen! Listen! They're trying to break through the hull. Edward and Mom, Dad, all the folks. But, but they're changing now. They're, they're melting and changing back into... They're Martians! Can you understand? Martians, not men! They, they make us think that Mars was heaven and we fell through the trap. Can you hear me, Earth? You've got to stop the next rocket! Listen, tell my brother Will. Tell my brother not to come. They'll trap him, too. They'll kill them all. Hello! Hello! Can you hear me, Earth? This is John Black on Mars! Hello, Earth! This is John Black on Mars! Tonight, X-1 has brought you the science fiction classic, Mars is Heaven. Written by Ray Bradbury and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Black and Peter Capel as Dr. Horst. With Bill Zuckert as Masters, Bill Lipton as Hingston, Margaret Berlin as the old lady, Bill Griffiths as Edward, Ken Williams as Lustig, Ethel Everett as Mom, and Edwin Jerome as Dad. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is a transcribed NBC Radio Network production. Minus one. Radio England UK 2. Radio England UK 2. Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Radio England UK 2. I thought PPI was just something you could get if you didn't wear goggles at the swimming baths. <laughs> And he said, you know, Mick, I sold my bike to Seamus, but if I had known he wasn't going to pay me, I would have charged him twice as much. Radio England UK 2. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned the homicide detail. You get a call that a 72-year-old man has been murdered. His invalid wife has been brutally beaten. There's no lead to the assailants. Your job, get them. When you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know, and you ought to know, what that cigarette is meant to people who smoke it and who smoke it all the time. For almost a year now, a medical specialist has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months. He reports no adverse effects to their noses, their throats, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. You'll find Chesterfield much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 12th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 8, 12 a.m. when we got to 8469 North Brighton Avenue. The front door. Yes? Mrs. Hurley? Yes, who are you? Police officers. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh, well, it's about time you got here. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if we could see Mrs. Stone. I don't think so. 
The ambulance man's with her now, giving her some kind of pill, something to calm her down. Lord knows the poor thing certainly needs something. Yes, ma'am. Would you like to see her, please? Like I said, I don't know if you can. I'll have to ask the ambulance man. Well, I'm sure it's all right, ma'am, if you just let us talk to the attendant. You just wait here. I'll talk to him. Now, look, I don't like to be rude, ma'am, but this is a murder investigation. If you'll open the door, please. How do I know you're what you say you are? How do I know you're cops? Well, here's our identification. Well, looks enough like you, I guess. All right, come on. Thank you. Where is Mrs. Stone? Back there, in the back bedroom. I'll check with the attendant. Jeff. Right, Frank. I wonder if you could tell us what you know about this, Mrs. Hurley. You just bet I can. You just bet. That poor woman back there. She's lying at death's door because you didn't do your job, you know that? Ma'am? At death's door. It's your job to see that things like this don't happen. That's what you're paid for. And look, just look. Her poor husband dead and herself all beaten. Poor thing. I just don't understand what the world's coming to when things like this can happen. Well, first, ma'am, there was no way we could stop this. I think you understand that. We're trying to clean it up now. We're going to need your help to do it. Now, if you just tell me what happened, please. Yeah. That's what you say. I know different. All right, Miss Hurley. The faster we can get started on this thing, the better chance we have of getting the people responsible for it. I suppose so. Well, what do you want to know? Well, if you'd please start at the beginning and tell me what you know about it. Yeah. Well, it started this morning. About 7 or 7.15, I think. I heard this noise at the back door, kind of a scratching kind of noise. And a moan, a little tiny moan. Sounded like it was way off, kind of in the distance. Yes, ma'am. First, I wasn't sure that I wasn't dreaming the whole thing. You know how it is when you're awakened out of a sound sleep. Yes, I understand. Well, it was like that. It took me about ten minutes before I knew that there really was something there. Well, I got up and went to the door. And that's when I found her, right there at the back door, kind of laying on the porch. I could see right away that someone had beaten her. That's when I called the ambulance. And then she told me about how her husband had been killed, and then I called you. The other car, the one with the men in uniform, come out. Mm -hmm. They looked around, and then they went over to the house. That would be the Stone's house? That's right. Next door. I see. How about it, Frank? Well, it's pretty bad, Joe. They're treating her now. Can we see her? Well, the attendant says it'll be all right for a couple of minutes. Not much more than that. They're going to take her to Georgia Street. Okay. He said he'd let us know and we could talk to her. All right, fine. Did she tell you what happened, Mrs. Hurley, anything at all? Just that there was two men. They come in and beat up on her, killed her husband. That was enough. One look at her and I could tell she was hurt bad. And her an invalid. I just don't understand how anybody in their right mind could do a thing like this. I just don't understand it. Yes, ma'am. Now, you say that she's an invalid, is that right? <sighs> yes, they were involved in an auto accident a couple of years ago. Some drunk ran right into him, smashed the car all up, laid Mr. Stone up for a couple of months and put Patricia in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Can't walk at all. She crawled over here. Don't know how she did it. it great courage. Yes, ma'am. Did you hear anything at all last night? Any disturbances? Not a thing. What you told not me? a thing. Went to bed about ten. Slept like a rock. Didn't hear a thing until this morning. That was about seven, seven fifteen, maybe. Like I said, nope. I didn't hear a thing. Well, do you know if there was anyone that the Stones were afraid of? Anyone who might have done a thing like this? Nope. I can't think of a soul. How about money, ma'am? Did Mister Stone keep large sums of money around the house? Well, now I don't know. You might have. Joe. Well, yeah, hell. You want to see her now? Yeah, come on, Frank. All right. You're going to want to talk to me some more? Yes, ma'am. We'll be back. <laughs> Mrs. Stone? <laughs> Mrs. Stone? Yes? Who is it? Police officers, ma'am. We know you don't feel well, but there are a few questions we'd like to ask, if you don't mind. You got them in yet? The ones who did this? No, ma'am, not yet. I tried to tell them. I tried. They just wouldn't listen. Ma'am. I told them to take whatever they wanted and leave us alone. Just leave us alone. I tried to tell them. They wouldn't listen. They killed Henry. They tried to kill me. Do you know who they were, Mrs. Stone? What? I say, do you know who they were? The men who did this, do you know who they were? Had you ever seen them before? No, I don't think so. It was dark. And then I heard them argue with Henry. I tried to get up. I tried to help him, but I couldn't. I screamed, but they didn't pay attention. And then they killed her. Ma'am, can you describe them for us? Tell us how tall they were, how they were dressed, maybe? They didn't know that I was there. And then they came into my room, and they said they'd kill the other one, so they might as well kill me, too. I tried to tell them to go away. They wouldn't listen. 
They just hit me and hit me and hit me. There wasn't anything I could do. Did they drive a car, ma'am? Is there anything you can tell us that might help us in identifying them? Did one of them use a name, maybe? They locked me in the closet. They put that pillow over my head. I don't know why. I told them they could take what they wanted. Take it or they just leave us alone. But they didn't. They killed Henry. They tried to kill me. All right, Mrs. Stone. Everything's going to be all right here. Don't worry. Now, just try and get some rest. doesn't matter much now. is isn't anything that matters anymore. Nothing now. They killed Henry. All right, ma'am. Please try not to get upset. Joe. Yeah. Better get her downtown. Well, how's it look for her, Hal? What are her chances? Depends. Yeah. How hard she wants to try. Eight forty-six a.m. The ambulance removed Mrs. Stone to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. We put in a call to the crime lab, and then we talked to the neighbor, Mrs. Hurley. She could add little to what she'd already told us. She said that she'd heard no loud noises during the night and that she'd seen no one in the neighborhood acting suspicious. She told us, however, that Mr. Stone was known to have kept large sums of money in the house. She went on to say that he made no attempt to hide his distrust of banks and that he had often said that all of his money was on the premises. 9.02 a.m., Frank and I went next door to the Stone home. The crime lab and latent fingerprint crews had arrived and were going over the place for physical evidence. We talked to Ray Pinker of the crime lab. This is how they got in. Yeah, toward the screen, huh? Must have done it with their hands. Couldn't find any tool marks. You figure the door was open then, huh, Ray? Yeah, it looks that way. One of those old-fashioned locks, no indication that they forced it. Mm-hmm. Did you find anything else? Take a look back here in the closet. Mm-hmm. Well, they sure tore the place up, didn't they? Yeah, went through everything. Even took the pictures off the walls. Yeah. Ripped up the bedding. It was in a the drawer they didn't go through. Any prints at all? Bergman's checking it. Haven't found anything yet that I know of. Pretty bad. Here. Look at the mattress on the husband's bed. Hmm. Tore it all up. Stuffing scattered around the room. Looks like a tornado went through the place. The closet's back here. Mm-hmm. This was Mrs. Stone's room. See where they dragged her. Yeah. Must have hit her the first time about here, and then they dragged her over to this closet, dropped her in here. Mm-hmm. You can see where she stacked those suitcases up there to pull herself out the window. Yeah. I don't know how she did it. Mm. Bad off as she was. Looks like robbery was the motive then, huh, Ray? Can't agree with that, Joe. Why? Come on back in Stone's room. We found the murder weapon. Checked around. It looks like they picked him up in the backyard. Here, take a look. A couple of wooden clubs. Looks like they came from a walnut tree just outside the back door. Kind of blows the robbery angle. Yeah. They were ready to kill the Stones when they came in. a.m. The crime lab finished their investigation of the house. The backyard and the surrounding ground were gone over. In the soft earth at the foot of one of the walnut trees, a pair of footprints was found and plaster casts were made of them. On the lower limbs of the trees, we found the place where the two clubs could have been taken. The rest of the yard and the immediate vicinity were combed, but we found nothing. 12.15 p.m. Frank put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. They told him that Mrs. Stone had been given emergency treatment and then had been removed to the county hospital. Her condition was listed as critical. They said that it would be some time before we'd be able to talk to her. 1.30 p.m. We began to canvass the neighborhood. From the people in the surrounding houses, we found that Mr. Stone had retired from the wholesale grocery business about 10 years ago. He devoted himself to the cultivation of prize roses and the care of Mrs. Stone. The neighbors told us that the Stones were quiet and that they seldom entertained. 3.15 p.m. We went back to talk to Mrs. Hurley. I knew you'd be back. Ma'am? I knew you'd come back to talk to me again. Could have told you a lot, but I thought I'd just let you try and find out for yourself. Didn't do too well, did you, hmm? Did you? I don't think I understand, Miss Hurley. Simple. Anything you want to know about this neighborhood, you come to the source. That's me. Anybody knows what's going on here, I do. Yeah, well, if you had information that you thought we should have had, why didn't you tell us before, ma'am? I didn't want to. Ma'am? I said I didn't want to. I still say that you were responsible for this whole thing, done your job, and it wouldn't have happened. Oh, I still haven't forgot. Oh, no, sir. Now, look, Miss Hurley, this is a murder investigation. I've told you that before. A man has been killed, a woman's been badly beaten. We're going to need all the cooperation from you that we can get. I'm ready now. What? I'll cooperate. I'll tell you what you want to know. All right, Miss Hurley. First, do you have any idea who might have done this? You just bet I have. Who, ma'am? Their boy. 
Only one that's mean enough to do it. Only one. Their boy? Sure. Herman Jr., he's the one. You just bet. Why do you say that? Because I know that's why. Mean kid. Always had trouble with him. Because the only trouble ever was between Patricia and me. Troublemaker. But he was pure and simple, a troublemaker. How old is this boy, Miss Hurley? 36, a real monster. You know where the boy is now? No, and I'm not interested. Happiest day of my life when he moved out of the house. Oh, he and I used to get in some arguments. Little brat. Stand there and think he was so big. Finally, Mr. Stone saw it. Told him to get out. Moved right out of the house, bag and parcel, right out. You mean that Mr. Stone and the boy had arguments? See? That's what I mean. No wonder people don't cooperate with you. I beg your pardon? I say something, then you ask me if I mean it. Of course I mean it. I wouldn't say it otherwise. Like people who ask, what time is it? You tell them, and then they ask if you're sure. If they don't want to believe you, why do they ask you in the first place? Yes, ma'am. Were you there at the time, ma'am? No. No, I wasn't. It was a warm night. Just a couple of months ago, all the windows was open, and I just couldn't help seeing into their house. You know, houses being so close together, you can understand it. Yes, ma'am, we can understand I don't like the way you said that, young man. Well, I didn't mean anything by it, Mrs. Hurley. Oh, uh, well, I suppose not. But I don't want you to get the idea that I'm the nosy type. Oh, no, ma'am, not at all. Well, anyway, Mr. Stone told Herman to get his things and get out. Right out. That night. Uh-huh. Well, did the boy leave that night? Oh, ma'am? yes, yes. Went right into his room and packed. Said he'd never come back, that he didn't want anything more to do with the old man. Mm-hmm. And his father said that was the way he wanted it. He was going to cut him out of his will. Well, you can just believe that's when the trouble really started. Well, now, where was Mrs. Stone all this time? Well, she was in her room, but she come out, wheeled herself right out, told them to stop this foolishness. She always was kind of pampering the boy. I think myself, that's what caused him to be like he was. You know, tied to his mother's apron strings all the time. Yes, ma'am. That's when Herman said that about doing something. Said that the old man was senile. Said that he was crazy. And that the money was his, and he was going to see that he got it. Mm -hmm. Said he meant to have it if he had to kill somebody. 4.10 p.m. We got the full name and description of the stone boy from Mrs. Hurley. We went back to the office and ran the name through R&I. We found a Herman Stone Jr. with a record listing three arrests on charges of 4127A LAMC. We checked out his last known address, a hotel on South Hill, and found that he'd moved several weeks before. The manager gave us a forwarding address, and at 6.10 p.m., Frank and I drove out to see him. It was a large apartment hotel on Wilshire Boulevard. We talked to the desk clerk. Sure, I know Herman. Nice guy. Once in a while, he gets a little loud, but most of the time, he's a real nice guy. Is he here now? I don't think so. Let me look. Ah, key's here. I think I saw him go out about an hour ago. He wasn't feeling too well. Bad hangover. Any idea where you might be? No, like I said, I didn't talk to him. Just saw him go out. You know what he does for a living? Herman? Yes, sir. I don't think he does nothing. Plays the horses a little bit. Picks up a buck that way. Good player. Sure knows the dogs. Given me a couple of tips. Didn't do any good. He sure does all right. Made a real killing yesterday. Must have hit it for about four or five thousand. That right? Yeah. Showed me the money this morning. Real big roll. At least four or five grand. Tips he gave me never did that good. You got any idea where he was last night? So what's this all about anyway? Herm done something? Well, it'd be better if we talked to him. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess you guys know what you're doing, huh? Well, yes, sir. He asked me if I knew what he was doing last night? Uh-huh. I sure do. He really tied one on. Of course, with his luck, I don't wonder. He really tied one on. Sir? Loaded. He got in here. He had a bottle. So you won't say anything about this to the management, will you? No, sir, we won't. Couldn't have that happen. They don't approve of drinking while I'm on duty. You understand. Kind of stuffy, but that's the way they look at it. Uh-huh. Like I said, old Herm rolls in here and he's got this bottle. Asked me to have one with him. Well, I don't like to get him sore, so I do. And we have a couple of more. Old Herm, that boy can really put it away. Yes, sir. What time was that? Well, let's see. I guess about 7, maybe 7.15. Mm-hmm. Did he go out after that? Sure didn't. Killed the bottle and then he passed right out, cold. Slept there on that couch. Uh-huh. No, sir. Old Herm didn't go anyplace. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is the first cigarette to offer smokers premium quality in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality 
and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients, ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Eight twelve p.m. Herman Stone returned to the hotel. Frank and I talked to him for about an hour. He appeared quite shaken when we told him of his father's death. We questioned him about the money that he'd suddenly come up with. He explained that he'd won it at the races. He gave us the name of the man who accompanied him to the track. Frank and I checked with him and found that Stone's story was true. We checked his shoe size and found that it was not the same as the print found at the scene of the murder. 10.46 p.m. We called the office and they told us that we'd gotten a message from the county hospital. Mrs. Stone was able to talk. She wasn't completely out of danger, but barring a relapse, she was expected to recover. Frank and I drove out to the hospital and talked to her. I wish I could help you more than I have, but there just isn't anything else. Well, could you give us any idea of about how tall they were? Well, that'd be pretty hard to do, Mr. Friday. I was lying down when they came into my room. I could only guess, but I'd say maybe as tall as you. I don't think much taller. I see. You know, how about their build, ma'am? Was it heavy or slight? I can't be sure. I guess if I must say one or the other, I have to say they're about medium. One was very strong, though. Ma'am? The one that carried me to the closet. He was strong. Just lifted me out of bed and carried me over to the closet and threw me on the floor. Did your husband have any large amounts of money in the house? Yes. Yes, he did. Herman never believed in banks, not since the crash. He always said that he could take care of the money as well as they could. Yes, ma'am. He had all of his savings in the house. Kept them in the mattress on, on his bed. Do you know about how much that might be, Mrs. Stone? I'd only be guessing, but I'd say maybe twelve or $13,000. Herman didn't discuss finances with me. He always thought it was a man's business and that I shouldn't have to worry about it. I tried to tell him. Tried all the time. What's that, ma'am? That he should put the money in a bank. He used to talk about it, too. I know that didn't help any. Well, who did he talk to, Mrs. Stone? People in the neighborhood. He used to tell them that he didn't get the interest, but that he always knew just where his money was. He used to ask them if they could say the same. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anybody in the neighborhood who might do a thing like this? Oh, no. We've lived there for a long time. No, none of them would even think about it. I see. Did you or your husband have any enemies? Anyone that you had any arguments with, maybe? No, there wasn't anyone. Mr. Friday? Yes, ma'am? Does my son know about this? Does he know that his father is... Does he know about it? Yes, ma'am, he does. He's outside in the hall right now. He said he'd like to see you. Poor boy. Never did get along with his father. I tried to make them understand each other. I tried so hard. Didn't seem to do any good. Mm-hmm. Well, if there's nothing else that you can tell us, ma'am. There's one thing... I hate to mention it. It seems so silly. What's that, Mrs. Stone? Well, when they were arguing with Herman in the next room, they got very loud. I thought that I recognized one of the voices, and I can't be sure, but at the time, I thought it. Yes, ma'am. Then when they came into my room, I was pretty sure. But I could be wrong, and I... Well, I wouldn't want to cause anybody any trouble. I wouldn't want to make a mistake. Well, who do you think it might have been? Whose voice do you think it was? It sounded like Smokey's. Who? Smokey. He used to do some work around the yard for Herman. That was a year or so ago. I haven't seen him since then. Well, do you know where we can get in touch with him, ma'am? No, I don't. As I said, I haven't seen him in over a year. What's his full name, Mrs. Stone? I don't know. But that, that's why I thought it might be a little silly. I don't even know his right name. He just told us his name was Smokey. The young man always had a cigarette in his mouth. Chain smoker, I think you'd call. Uh-huh. Herman used to kid him about it, you know, smoking all the time. I don't think Smokey liked it. He was a pretty serious young man. He used to get a little angry at Herman. I see. Can you give us a description of the man? Oh, yes. Nice-looking boy. I hope I haven't made a mistake. I hope I haven't done the wrong thing. Well, don't you worry about it, Miss Stone. What? That's his worry now. <laughs>
We continued to talk to Mrs. Stone. We got the description of the handyman who'd worked for her husband. 11.28 p.m., we went back to the city hall and ran the name and description through the moniker files in R&I. We came up with one good possible. In checking his record, we found that his full name was Charles P. Roxford. His age was listed as 37 years. The rest of his description matched the one we'd gotten from Mrs. Stone. He had an arrest record listing several charges of forgery. And at that time, there was an outstanding warrant on him for check passing. We went back to the office and called forgery division. Yeah, Roxford. Yeah, that's right, Charles R. Huh? Oh, we want to talk to him about a killing out on Brighton. Yeah. What? When was that? Yeah. Okay, we'll be right there. Well, that's a break. What do you mean? They know where he is? They got him. Charles Roxford had been picked up a few minutes before by officers in forgery division while he was trying to pass a bad check. Frank and I went down the hall and took the prisoner to the interrogation room. We talked to him for two hours. During that time, he'd admit nothing except his name and that he'd been trying to pass a phony check. Hey, you're off your rocker and you know it. You got me for one thing, hanging paper. That's it and you can't make anything more out of it. How about this money we found on you? Yeah, how about it? Where'd it come from? I won it. Where? In a crap game. Where was the game? I forgot. It was a floating game. Moved around a lot. You worked for the Stone family a year or so ago? I don't know. I might have. I worked for a lot of people. You worked for them? I might have, like I said. They seem to think you did. All right, so I did. What's that mean? You ever have any arguments with Stone? No. Got along good. Never had no trouble. His wife thinks different. Oh, that's so? That's right. Then she's off a rocket, too. Now, look, maybe you guys got all night, but I haven't. You aren't going anyplace. Well, how about booking me in? Let's talk in the morning, then, huh? All right, fine, Roxford. As soon as you answer a few more questions I for I told us. you all I know. Maybe you forgot some. Let's go over it again. What do you say? All right, all right. Where do you want to start? Well, can you tell us what you've been doing the last few days? Uh, any day in particular, or do you want to run down minute by minute? You just tell us what you've been doing, will you? Uh, let's see. Uh, this is Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah, it's Tuesday. All right, let's start with Monday. Is that all right with you? Come on, get on with it. Well, I got up yesterday morning about... Uh, I think it was 11.30, lit a cigarette, got dressed, went downstairs and had some breakfast. Interesting? Go ahead. Oh, I can spice it up for you, you know, if you want. It's kind of dull when you tell it straight. Well, you just tell a story, man. Oh, what are you guys trying to prove? What are you trying to tell? What'd you do last night? I had dinner and went to a show. Where'd you eat dinner? Place down on the spring. Did you eat alone? Yeah. What'd you do then? Like I said, I went to a show. Who went with you? Nobody. I, I didn't say anybody went with me. Oh, I must have thought you said that. Yeah. I went alone. All right. Where'd you go after that? I walked around, had a couple of drinks. Where? A bar down on Fifth. What time was that? About 12.30 or so. Anybody with you? No. You know the bartender? No, I never went in a place before. Then you got no way of proving you were there, is No, it? do I have to? Did it help? Well, why? I'm a big boy now. I don't have to explain anything to you guys. Now, get off my back, will you? I'm getting sick of playing footsie. Where'd you go after you left that bar? I went home. Where's that? It's a place over on Fourth. What time did you get in? I don't know. Maybe 1.30, 2. Mm-hmm. Desk clerk see you come in? No, he's asleep. How long ago did you say you worked for the Stone? I didn't. You said I worked for him a year ago. Is that right? I guess so. I forgot. What, what's this bit about the stones? You got any way of proving where you were last night? Like I said, I don't have to. That's the way you look at it, mister. You're in trouble if you can't come up with an alibi we can't break. Is that right? Yep. Why? Because Mrs. Stone got a good look at you. She couldn't have. The lights were out. Yeah, no, that's clever, Roxford. Do you want to tell us about it now? Come on, Roxford. <laughs> All right, I should have known. I should have known. I never should have done it, but I didn't have any choice. You... you... You can't figure that, can you? What do you mean? Well, I, I owed this money. The guys are getting tired of waiting. They said I had to come up with it. I, I didn't have any choice. Is that right? Sure. Well, you can see it, can't you? I had to come up with the money. I tried to win it back. The more I played, the more I owed him. There just wasn't any other way. I knew old man Stone had it. Wasn't doing him any good, and I needed it, and I knew where he kept the money. Who was with you? Jackie Forbes. You know where we can find him? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. All right, you want to get the stenographer, Frank? Yeah. I should have known. I don't know, but there just wasn't any choice. There wasn't any other way. Well, why'd you kill him? He knew who I was. There's no choice. I had to. Is that right? Well, sure. You can see that yourself, can't you? I, I couldn't find any other way. You didn't look very hard, did you? Radio England UK 2. Radio England UK 2. Tune in again for more transcribed thrills and adventures. Find out what happens to the Earth people as they speed toward a new world on Planaria Rex. Rocket millions of light years into space with Dan Troll, the Planet Man. Radio England, UK 2. The Planet Man. Radio England, UK 2.
Paddy was weighing himself on the scales, and he kept pulling in his stomach. His wife says, that won't help. He said, if I don't hold my stomach in, I can't see the numbers. Hey, I'm sorry, we're all full up at A&E. We're going to have to send you to B&Q. <laughs> Radio England UK 2. Oh, Radio England UK 2. Radio England UK 2. Radio England UK 2. Drama. It was hot, boiling hot that night. I wanted to grab a beer and turn in early. So what happens? I get my beer, but with it comes a gunshot, a beautiful woman in trouble, and murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime mystery, CBS presents his most famous character, brought to you now in... The Adventures of Philip Barlow. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Christmas for Carol, a suspense play starring Mr. Dennis Day. Hey, Hap. Well, hello, Sandy. What? Why, it's Wilcox. Now, what are you doing in that costume, Harlow? Going to a Christmas party, Hap. Mm, what's in the sack? Why, a load of merry motoring. In this box, I've got smoother performance, you see? Ignition engineered auto light spark plugs. Sure, and when you replace worn out spark plugs with these new Bantam beauties, your car will perform smoother than Santa skidding down a slippery chimney. And what's in this box, Harlow? Fast starts, Hap. Well, these are ignition engineered auto light spark plugs, too. You bet. And they're unmatched for quick starts because they're designed by the same auto light engineers who design the coil, distributor, and all the other important parts of the complete ignition system for many leading makes of our finest cars. That's why ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs work as a team with your car's ignition system. And that's why they're world famous for quality and dependability. And I suppose you're giving gas savings in the third box, eh, Harlow? You guessed it, Hap. So, friends, have your Autolite spark plug dealer replace worn-out spark plugs with ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Choose either the standard or resistor type. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, with Christmas for Carol and the performance of Dennis Day, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in... Suspense. It was dark and silent. The window in the house glinted a little from the Christmas tree lights. Rocky didn't move. He just stood there in the alley, but I wanted to run. Fast, get away and put it behind me. Just a second. We got the money, Rocky. What are we hanging around for? Come on, let's get out of here. I said we wait for the old couple to get back. What for? Why take chances now? We got some money. How do we know it's all of it? Maybe they split it and put it in two places. We'll wait here and watch for them when they come in. They'll tip it. It was 8000 That's what he withdrew. You asked for this, kid. Now do as you're told. We wait. <laughs> scared. This was my first job. My first and last. I just wanted that money. I wanted it fast and short and I wanted to run away from it and forget it. A one shot. That's why I got hold of Rocky Correa. Lucky. I had to be lucky just this once. For Carol, not for me. It was for Carol. Nothing else I cared about, see? It didn't seem possible now that three days ago I hadn't known Rocky. Hadn't needed him. <laughs> What is it, Doctor? How about the baby? Your wife must remain in bed. Serious? No, not serious, but she's got to stay flat on her back. A, a nurse. You should have a nurse with her all the time. Oh, but it's two months away, Doctor. It's just a question of keeping her relaxed and quiet, not letting her do any work around the house, or lift things, or even walk. Okay. Okay, Doctor. And she'll be all right? Uh, there's one other thing. Uh, she was quite worried when I told her about the nurse. I, I got the feeling she's, well, afraid to have the baby. Afraid? Not for herself. I can't put my finger on it, but it's having a detrimental effect on her condition, and I... I know what it is, Doctor. Money. Oh, I 
I see. Well, it might not be easy finding a nurse only four days till Christmas. I'll get one, Doctor. Thanks. I'll call you in the season. Yeah. Thanks again, Doctor. Sweetheart, it'll be all right. I'm going to get the nurse to take care of you. I'll be able to get up and around a day or two. Not if you want that son. The doc said everything will be all right if you take it easy. You're going to take it easy. But a nurse... Look, I've got to get back to the bank. I'm only on my lunch hour, sweetheart. I'll make a few calls from there, and tonight we'll pick out the nurse. How... How much do they charge? What's the difference? How much, Paul? It's a lot of money, I know. Fifty, sixty a week. We'll make out all right now. There's nothing to worry about. Oh, Paul... This was going to be a happy Christmas now. Yeah, a happy Christmas in this dump. It's funny, Paul. Fifty dollars a week for a nurse for another two months. It's funny. You make forty-eight fifty at the bank. We'll have to pay the nurse more money than you earn. <laughs> Taking in money, paying it out. When I went back to work, I was seeing it for the first time with something more than a detached feeling. Thinking, I need this money. I need this money. I need this money. How oh, I need this money. But Carol and the baby. It was almost three o'clock when Eddie the bookie came in. Hi, Paul. Uh -huh. Good day yesterday. A big action in a few days. Santa need opens. Yeah. People like to throw their money away. They throw it? I catch it. Eddie... Now, could I see you later? You ready to make a deal? I want to talk to you. What time are you through? Five o'clock. Meet you outside at five o'clock. Eddie Garth, bookie. He quit school in the seventh grade. I held out and went through college. And all these years, he's tried to get me to go in with him. To run his office, do the bookwork. He was waiting for me when I finished work. We went to a coffee shop and sat down. And all around us, the loudspeakers reminding me what a happy Christmas it was. Hush, Carol, Paul. Not so good, Eddie. That's, that's what I want to talk to you about. Ah, uh, no more loans, Paul. You need money? Come with me. Don't you ever give up. What's so good at the bank? Twenty-five bucks for a Christmas bonus? Look, Eddie, come in with me now. With Santa need opening. I could work the outside, get no accounts. Eddie. And I'll give you ten percent of those accounts, Paul. But I won't lend you the money. I'd be a sucker to lend it to you. I'll give it to you if you come in, but I won't lend you anymore. Okay, Eddie. Forget it. I'll get it some other way. I don't get it. What's wrong with my deal? Look, Eddie, how many times have you been rousted by the vice squad? Plenty. Well, and every time they book you and they fingerprint you and take your picture. So what? They never have anything on me. It's on your record, Eddie. As long as you live. Oh. Sure, I need money. Maybe I'm getting close to the time when I'm not too choosy about the way I get it. But it won't be your way. What? What are you talking about? If I ever break the law, it's going to be with the right guy and it's going to be the right job. Are you dreaming, Paul? You'll still be in that cage ten years from now. I'd hit and run. One job with enough out of it to make it worthwhile. That's the way to be, Eddie. A one shot. There is no such thing, Paul. You do something like that, you're stuck in it. And you're worse off than if you came with me. Think about it, Paul. Carol, all the time, thinking of the money and Carol and the baby and debts. The worry eating at me and thinking about what I'd said to Eddie. Then the next morning, old man Forbes made a withdrawal. The first he'd ever made. Hi, son. What? Oh, hello, Mr. Forbes. I'm going to miss you, son. Seems like we're good friends after all these years. Miss me? <laughs> Take a look at the slip. Mm. That's a lot of money. Twelve years hard work. That's what that money means. But you're taking it all out? Yeah. And I quit my job today. Quit your job? Ada and me, we've been waiting a long time for this Christmas. We're moving out of the city. Oh? And we've had our eye on a little farm. Now we can buy it. You've got the papers drawn up. Then you're you're leaving right away? About a week. But Ada don't know yet. I'm going to surprise her. Kind of a Christmas present. But it's not safe to keep so much cash on you, especially... Oh, I've got a perfect place to hide it, son. No one would think to look there. Besides, I figure I've worked too hard and too long to lose it now. Oh, no, son. It wouldn't happen. Wouldn't seem right, son. It stayed with me and it grew. Like a wheel spinning, gaining momentum. This could be the right job. $8,000 a 
hours, enough for that single shot. It stayed with me, all the time growing, growing. Yeah, lunch is on me, Paul. If you change your mind. No, I called you, Eddie, because I... I need your help. What kind of help? Well, you can arrange for me to talk to someone. Maybe. Who is it? Rocky Pereira. Rocky Pereira? Are you kidding? You picked yourself the right guy, all right. The cops don't even know what he looks like. They never mugged him or printed him. Yes, Eddie, that's right. You're crazy, I tell you. A million people want to talk to Rocky Pereira, including the cops. No. No, Paul, I can't touch it. You can, Eddie, if you wanted to bad enough. Please, Eddie. All right. Let's see what I can do. Maybe I do know someone. And, Eddie, it's got to be soon. You know you'll be taking a chance. It better be good. It is, Eddie. Good enough to take the chance for. That was two days ago. And this morning, Eddie came through. A certain friend, Rocky's only outside contact, told him to keep an eye on a house on Hoover Street. Eddie gave me all the dope. What Rocky looked like, how he'd act, what to expect. And early this evening, I told, told Carol I was going out for a while, that I'd, I'd borrow the money from Eddie, and we wouldn't have to worry about paying it back for a while. That's what I told her, but that wasn't the answer. The answer was at the house on Hoover with Rocky Perea. I waited there, hidden in the dark corner behind the incinerator. I kept thinking, making excuses. It wasn't up to me anymore. It wasn't any other choice. I needed money, desperately. I needed help to get the money. I waited more than an hour. And then I heard footsteps come up the alley. He stopped before the open patch of light. Just like Eddie told me. He was careful. Very careful. Making sure no one was staking him. I took a deep breath and hitched my weight forward. I was going to cut across the open for the back door. I remember thinking, Now, do it for Carol. For the rotten, miserable Christmas. Do it now. Rocky! <laughs> for a split second. And almost faster than I could see, he ducked into a shadow and spun around. The street light didn't touch him. It glinted on something metallic in his hand. And even from where I was standing, I could see he had a gun pointed at me. Autolite is bringing you Mr. Dennis Day in Christmas for Carol. Tonight's production and radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Rocky, don't shoot. It was a good thing I said it. His gun was aiming front and center. He crouched there looking at me, his eyes flat and hard, and his voice deep and tight and deadly. Who are you? I'm not a cop, Rocky. Come close so I can see you better. Sure, Rocky. I just want to talk to you. You call me Rocky. You been talking to anyone? I've been watching you. I know you're Rocky Perea. You have been watching me? What for? You're wanted, Rocky, and you need money. Who are you? Where'd you come from? That doesn't matter, Rocky. This is a business deal. I figured it out very carefully. You need money, well, so do I. And I got a way to get it. Just like that, eh? And Rocky, I'm not staying. This is a one-shot deal. A one-shot? There's no such thing. That's the way it's got to be. We do this job together and we're through. We never see each other again. I sure ain't gonna go looking for you. But you won't quit. Not if it comes off easy. I'll quit, Rocky. What's in this for me? Half. Four thousand huh. dollars. Well, kids, you ain't dumb by any means, staking me out like this. Almost smart enough to be a copper. You got guts, still. Tell me, you got a family? There's uh, no one to stop me. I have a job that doesn't pay enough. This will raise my salary. You want this one haul, then it's back to your job, eh? Yeah. Is it a deal? What's the job? I have a car. I'll tell you on the way. If you go for it, okay. If not, we could get the whole thing. Okay, kid. I'll listen to it. Let's go driving. I told him what I planned and why I needed him. And he agreed to come with me. We drove to the Forbes' house. It was a small and old house. Just big enough for the two of them. I drove down to the corner and parked and we started back. Lucky there's no one on the street. Let's go up the alley. Yeah, Rocky. There's the back door. Look, no lights. They're not home. That makes it a cinch. 
Okay, go on, second. It's your baby. Rocky, I'll have to break a window. Yeah. You want me to hold your hand? I'll wrap my jacket around my fist. That'll keep the noise down. Why don't you write me a book? Okay, okay, I'm going. I was lucky. The side of the house was hidden from the street by a big tree. There was light to see with from the Christmas tree in the living room. I wrapped the jacket around my knuckles and with a short, sharp jab broke through the window. It sounded like a cannon. The street being so quiet before, I was scared it would rouse the whole neighborhood. But like I said, I was lucky. I scrambled up the sill and dropped into the living room. I was pretty clumsy. I pulled out drawers, looked behind pictures, hung the cushions. I went in the kitchen and poked around the cabinets. I looked in the cookie jar and I found a rolled up wad of bills. It was money, all right, but only $40. The old lady's secret treasure. I put it back and went into the living room again. Looking around, nervous, I stumbled on the Christmas tree and knocked it over. And then I remembered what the old man had said. A Christmas present for his wife. And I knew it was somewhere in that tree. There were Christmas stockings and favors and little red boots in and around the tinsel and the lighted bulbs. And I found the $8,000 hidden deep in one of the stockings. Got it, Rocky. Let me see it. It's there, Rocky. It's all there. Yeah, eight grand. I guess I'll hold it. Come on, let's go. Take it easy. We're going to stick around for a while. Stick around? What for? Well, we got some money. How do we know it's all of it? Maybe they split it and put it in two places. We'll wait here and watch when they come in. They'll tip it. It was 8000 That's what he withdrew. You ask for this, kid. Now do as you're told. We wait. I couldn't help being scared. My first job. My first and last. A one shot. I wanted to get away fast, run, and put it behind me. But Rocky just stood there like he didn't have a worry in the world. Listen, kid, they're ringing for us. They're wishing us a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Wait, there they are. They're unlocking the door. You know, Harvey, the Christmas services were so beautiful. Sure were. This year in particular. Harvey, huh? look, the tree. Someone's been in here. A burglar. Burglar? My cookie jar. I've got my house money hidden there. <laughs> The old lady ran to the kitchen, but Forbes knew where to look, and he knew it was gone. Rocky was grinning, his face lit up like floodlights. Let's go, Rocky. We've seen enough. No, no. Hold on a minute. It's all here, Harvey. I wonder what he was after. Peter, it's gone. All the money. All what money? Eight thousand dollars. I took it all out of the bank. Ada, I, I, I quit my job. It was going to be a surprise. No. Every penny we had in the world. Oh, Harvey, all oh, that money. No, 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 it'll be all right, Ada. Oh, Twelve years you worked so we could have something. Well, I can keep on working, Ada. I'll, I'll do it all over again. Oh, you can't work anymore, the doctor. Oh, what's a person to believe? You work so hard and we do without things for twelve long years. And for what? In one minute, some good-for-nothing hoodlum takes it all away from us. I looked at Rocky standing there next to me, his face split by that grin. It was funny to him, something to laugh about, to gloat over. That's why he'd stayed. Suddenly, I knew I couldn't go through with it. Me, the guy who needed the money so bad, the guy with the bright one-shot idea. Quite a show, eh, kid? Come on, let's go. He moved off a few steps, but I just stood there, knowing what I was going to do. Come on, I said, let's go. Knowing what I was going to do. No. No, Rocky, we're not going. Huh? I said we're not going, and neither is the money. What's that? Don't, Rocky. I've got a gun, too. And what's got into you? I'm going to give that money back, Rocky. I I can't stomach this. Give it back. You're crazy. No, Rocky. I just didn't see deep enough. Old people like this. This was your idea. I'm responsible for it. I know, Rocky, but I can make it right. Suppose I don't give you the money. Then I'll kill you, Rocky. Okay, kid. You got the gun. He gave me the money, all the hate showing in his eyes. I turned and started for the house. I gave him my back for a target. But he didn't use it. I knocked on the door. Yes, who? Paul. 
from the bank. I, uh, I just had a fight with a guy, Mr. Forbes. Saw him jump from your window. I chased after him. Our window? You saw him? Yes, ma'am. I was walking past. I kind of figured he'd just finished robbing you. Would you catch him? Well, I couldn't hold on to him. He, uh, he broke away, but not before I got this. Why, Harvey, the money. Yes. Oh, oh bless you. Oh, forget it. I'm only sorry I couldn't hold him. Uh, you, you say you fought with this burglar? Yes, um, he broke away we, before... We want to thank you, Paul. Forget it. I'll, I'll be going now. Oh, wait, Paul, we want to give you a reward. Oh, no, no, I don't want a reward. I'll, I'll have to be going. <laughs> Stopped there on the porch for a minute, afraid to go back to Rocky. Suddenly, terribly afraid of what he'd do to me. And the old couple was still talking, loud, like old people do. Yes, it, it, it all happened so fast. I'll always wonder about that boy. What made him bring the money back? He's honest, Ada. I, I know him from the bank. Oh, fiddlesticks, Harvey. He didn't fight with anyone. What do you mean, Ada? Well, his clothes, by the whole story he told us. Your young friend took the money in the first place. Why, uh... Ada, I, I believe you're right. Of course I'm right. Now, what on earth made him change his mind like that? It's Christmas, Ada. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Even offered to give me a reward. Suddenly I felt something strange, like like being clean inside. Like being able to see something that wasn't there before. And the tightness, the fear eased a little. Now let's go, kid. The car. Rocky. You did what you wanted. You just forgot that half of that money was mine. Now move. Get it moving. What was it you said? You made me, Rocky. You're hot. Rocky, uh, I made a mistake. I want to team up with you, Rocky. You need money. I got away. I was wrong. Maybe the next job you won't get soft in the head. There's not going to be a next one, Rocky. I'm through. Through? You think I spent Christmas Eve with you because I like you? I'm out four grand. I'm kid. sorry, Rocky, but there's not going to be a next time. You think so, huh? Stop the car. All right. But I'll never see it different, Rocky. I found out tonight. If it's not these old people, then it's someone else taking it just as hard. Are you sure? Are you sure it's not Christmas doing this? I'm sure. It's not for me, Rocky. Huh. You know, I'm kind of glad it turned out this way. You what? Well, you're through, ain't you? You're going back to your job. Yeah, Rocky, sure. Good. And I figured it right. What? I didn't think you'd go through it and... Say, wait a minute. Yeah? You're not Rocky Perea. <laughs> I said you were a smart kid. But the way you acted, so careful, sneaking in the alley and... Say, who are you? Weissman's the name. Police Lieutenant Richard Weissman, gangster squad. You're a cop? But where's Rocky? We picked him up this afternoon, kid. He had a couple of guys working with him, and I thought maybe you were one of them. Now I know different. Cop. I don't expect I'll run into you again, kid. So take care of yourself. And uh, Merry Christmas. <laughs> All the breaks. But I was no better off than this morning. There was still money, two months paying the nurse. There was still the worry for Carol. Oh, Mr. Shane, we've been expecting you. Congratulations. Doctor, what's the matter? Why? <laughs> Nothing's wrong, quite the contrary. Your wife just had a baby. Baby? Carol? Oh, well, she's perfectly all right. So is your daughter. Carol. Oh, Carol, darling. Are you all right? Hello, sweetheart. I'm fine. Carol is... It's... We won't have to borrow the money now, Paul. It's turned out for the best after all. Oh, darling. And it always will, my dear. We have so much, you and I. We have each other. And now we've got a daughter. A fine, healthy little girl. 
The rest will come, Paul. Let's live the day we have. Your little girl's over there, Paul. Tell her we're very, very happy she's in the family. And wish her a Merry Christmas. The first Noel The angel did say Was to certain poor shepherds In fields as they lay In fields where they Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. Dennis Day. Santa visits girls and boys after they've been good, but Autolite keeps cars and trucks performing as they should. <laughs> right you are, Hap, because Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many leading makes of America's finest cars. Electric windshield wipers, starting motors, voltage regulators, coils, distributors, wire and cable generators. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. And because all Autolite parts are original factory parts, you can be sure you're right. Because you're always right with Autolite. Next week on Suspense, Mr. Cornell Wilde, a star of A Ring for Maria. And in weeks to come, you will hear such famous stars as Mickey Rooney, Ginger Rogers, Eve Arden, and Ezio Pinza. All appearing in tales well calculated to keep you in suspense. Radio England UK 2.